feeling like I could do what a mythological guy could do. Power is out to move. It's my time to make it impossible and impossible. This is Virtual Racing with Real Life Stakes. Great drivers perform when the pressure is at its highest. And that's right here. Right now. I'll call this a 20 car pileup. I'll be good with that. As long as put me in a checkered flag and victory lead. It ain't a game now. Me and you, we ain't the same now. Lions coming out to play now. Opposition out the way now. Out of the way. You wasn't invited Say you come to play I dare you to try it You don't wanna try me Then step up to my team Yeah, out of the way Yeah, yeah, out of the way Yeah, yeah, out of the way The road to $300,000 rolls through America's premier short track on the former fairgrounds just outside of Richmond, Virginia, where from the virtual Richmond Raceway, we say good evening, sim racing fans, and welcome to race five of the 2020 EDASCAR Coca-Cola iRacing Series. As we are each and every Tuesday night, we're happy that you're strapped into the seat and along for the ride with us on the iRacing Esports Network. Alongside Justin Prince and Tim Terry, my name is Zavid Pasoko. We'll get you primed for tonight's race with the rest of our broadcast team in just a moment. However, first I'd like to welcome special guest Dennis Bickmeyer, the president of Richard Raceway, onto our pre-race coverage. And Dennis, it's happy to have you on the air with us again but since we last chatted this Richmond Raceway esports program has only continued to grow but let's look all the way back for those who may not be familiar how did you all first get involved in this series and why well I think it goes back a couple of years and, and really it's a it's a great uh, you know strategic marketing initiative for us to you know attract a younger audience to what we're doing here at Richmond Raceway but I feel like we've been on the leading edge of, obviously, iRacing has been around for a long time. But I feel like, again, we've been on the leading edge and, and using it in our marketing efforts. Uh, we're using it as part of our event experience. If we were at Richmond Raceway this week uh, for our real race, um, you would see Sim Seats out there with some of their rigs. We've had 
uh, iRacing and, and esports tournaments at our facility. We're just all in on this platform and just really excited about how many eyeballs are on it uh, now and, and just really excited to see what's happening with, with uh, iRacing. You guys had a really busy, busy offseason, I should say, retaining Jimmy Mullis. You pick up the defending series champion in Zach Novak. You now have a development team as well. Just tell us about this expanded sim racing effort now in 2020. Well, and when we got in a couple of years ago, we had multiple drivers and, and many who are still uh, competing in the series today. So again, uh, glad that we were able to, to really jump in with both feet, but then to have Jimmy on our team again and, and to land Zach this year. Just what a great addition, a, a great duo to, to represent Richmond Raceway Esports and, and compete uh, on our behalf and certainly compete at this very high level. And then again, we thought it was very important to continue to always plan for the future and, and have Raja and Garrett as part of our development team uh, just really kind of solidifies our efforts uh, in this space. And, and again, they're great brand ambassadors for us. Uh, they're obviously very talented uh, in iRacing as well, and uh, really looking forward to tonight's action. And certainly a good reason so, because both of your cars look like they're going to be started up front. Uh, Dennis, thank you for the time. Best of luck to the team. Uh, happy to have you with us and to play host from the Virtual Richard Raceway, not only for tonight's NASCAR Coca-Cola iRacing Series event, but of course this upcoming Sunday with the NASCAR Pro Invitational iRacing Series as well. We'll now bring the rest of the booth team into the fold. And Tim, two weeks ago at Bristol Motor Speedway, it was Ryan Luza taking home a second straight win. Ty Nick Ottinger at 14 wins for second on the series all-time wins list. Uh, and of those, if uh, those at home tuned in and enjoyed that action two weeks ago and they like that short track atmosphere, they're probably going to have a lot of fun with us tonight as well. I said it off the top of the show two weeks ago. I'm a short track guy. I absolutely love this racing action, and especially here with the eNASCAR Coca-Cola iRacing Series. You mentioned Ryan Luza. Statistically, he's good here. Uh, he's obviously been good in 2020. Going to be tough to beat, but he's going to start uh, a little deep in the pack here this evening. So this should be a really good race. Can't wait to throw the green flag here in just a few moments. And for the third member of our broadcast team, Justin, happy to have you along for the ride as well as we're kind of in the middle of a de facto short track triple crown, almost Bristol last time out, Richmond tonight. And yes, I know Dover's a mile, but we go out there, uh, you know, for next time out to, in two weeks time. A lot of tough tracks here back to back to back after seeing a lot of the larger racetracks play host of the first few weeks. Yeah, absolutely. It definitely challenges a lot of these drivers having to do with the low downforce package or these short tracks. But this is a circuit tonight many have circled this evening because it is a technical track where it can be difficult to get in the corner. It's depending on how hard you have to get in said corner, how much throttle control you have at the apex, and how you exit the corners as this race progresses that makes it a driver's favorite and why some competitors were very looking forward to this in talks for preparations for tonight. And we had a lot of fun asking questions and answering those on the broadcast last week. You saw the Twitter handles up on the screen. Let us know where you're watching from. It'd be a part of the conversation tonight with the hashtag EDASCAR. But Tim Richmond is no stranger to this Coca-Cola iRacing Series campaign. In fact, it has been on the calendar every single year. So I'm sure you've got a lot of fun Tim facts looking into tonight's race. Yeah, this is the 11th visit we've been here every year since we started the series back in 2010. And uh, when you look at statistics, one name that comes up is Ray Alfala. Ray has won here three times. He's led 461 laps. In fact, he's led every single race except for two of those uh, being back in uh, 2015 and, of course, last year in 2019. Uh, dominating or maybe non-domination, three or four drivers have led more than 100 laps in a single event here. Three of those drivers have gone on to victory lane. The only one that hasn't gone on, Ray Alfala led 115 laps here back in 2012, which was won by Steve Sheehan. Experience, we talk about those names, guys like Steve Sheehan and Ray Alfala. Five drivers competed in this event or at this racetrack in 2010, the first time we were here, and all of them have a podium finish. You include Brad Davies in there, as well as Brian Schoenberg and John Gorlinski. Virginia is for non-lovers. This race gets a little bit physical sometimes, and you really have to push and shove. Average caution count is 10 here at Richmond. Last year's race in 2019 saw 10 yellows.
And of course, uh, it was an exciting time out as we get the spring date back on the calendar. So Justin, just like we saw last week at Bristol, no need to turn the lights on because her race it on a sunny afternoon. Absolutely beautiful skies, partly cloudy in fact, but these drivers are going to have to deal with a fairly hot temperature for tonight. 107 degrees Fahrenheit is the track temp this evening, 73 degrees is the air temp. Many competitors tonight have already discussed their expectations that there's the chance of drivers getting very loose, potentially even getting self spins because of how hot this track can be tonight. Also keep in mind that wind already gusting back and forth between 7 to 10 miles an hour. That's going to affect how the cars handle a bit in the quarters tonight. Could be a handful for some of these competitors in the short run. And one of the things that we've been doing on the pre-race portion of tonight's, uh, you know, the broadcast really all season long is our booth fantasy. And, of course, Randy Chenneth uh, out for this week under the weather. Hope to have him back. But that means that I am not as far behind as the top because Tim Terry assumes the top spot in our booth fantasy. I'm um, just a little bit behind. And I'll tell you what, I'm not feeling that hot about my pick. But we'll get to mine last, Justin, since uh, it's your first time up here with us. We'll let you go first. Two other laps on the board tonight. Who do you think ends up at Victory Lane? Well, we talked about the history and some of the dominance of drivers like Ryan Luza in the early portion of the season. The last time any driver had won three consecutive races was back in 2013. I'm betting on him tonight to be the next driver to do that this evening. So he goes for Luza, of course, the race winner here in 2019. Tim Terry, you've got all the numbers. Who'd you come up with? There's a lot of low-hanging fruit here, uh, Ryan Luza being one of them. You got Nick Ottinger, Ray Alfala. I was going to go with Steve Sheehan, but I consulted one of the drivers in the field, and I asked him, who would you pick besides yourself to go fast here? Uh, I had that conversation on Sunday morning, and that driver that won't be named told me Michael Conti. So uh, I'm going to go with the advice and go with the driver of the number eight JRM car and Michael Conti. And I tried to go off the board a little bit last week at Bristol, pick a driver at Nathan Lyon who had led a lot of laps the year prior and it just did not work out for him. So I went back on the board and I have Ryan Luza as my driver pick for tonight as well. We have seen repeat winners here every year since 2013. In 13 and 14, it was Ottinger. 15 and 16, it was Humpy. 17 and 18, it was Alfala. And Luza won it last year. So I'm going to stick with that trend. And I think Ryan Luza finds victory lane. However, if that's going to happen, uh, he's going to have to come from way behind because he does not have a strong qualifying effort in this one. All that's left, though, is to crank the music as we get set to go trackside and take a look at our iRacing starting grid for round number five. Pole position goes to none other than the Richmond Raceway Esports entry of Jimmy Mullis. He'll bring us to the green flying tonight, accompanied by Bobby Zelensky in second position. Logan Clamp, it looks pretty serious there for Bro 2. He's looking hot with McCollum fourth and Akista through P6, Tim. And you look down there, Nick Ottinger, Michael Conti. That's going to be a really quick row. Casey Kerwin lines up outside row number five. And Zach Novak for Richmond Raceway Esports. Justin is uh, in the uh, first six rows. Sherbert starting at 13 tonight alongside your OT and with Ashton Crowder in 15 spot. Matt Busa, Bob Ryan, Keegan Leahy amongst the top 18 starters. Six more teams represented on that, led by Garrett Lowe. You got the likes of Jeremy Allen, Malik Gray, and Brian Schoenberg through row 12. Uh, looking back through the field, you got Chris Overland, Dylan Duvall is going to be strong, Steve Sheehan, a former winner here, Justin Bolton going to be quick alongside Brad Davies. Jake Nichols, along with Ray Alfalva, are going to have a lot of work cut out for them in row 16. Brandon Cattell in row 17 with Michael Guest. Lake Reynolds, Michael Garigula, rounding up the top 18 rows. And unfortunately, there's our picks, Justin, on row 19. Ryan Luza, Corey Vincent, John Gorlinski, the only provisional, the Kane Cook. It is a look top the bottom. The Rai Racing starting grid, Tim. We already said 200 laps, 150 miles of action from the virtual Richmond Raceway. What's the tail of the tape tonight? When you look at this racetrack, obviously 200 laps here. Uh, the pit window is just over halfway, about 100 to 120 laps on fuel. I don't know if we're going to get there or not, but we've seen this race go with two cautions before as well. Pit road speed is 40 miles an hour, and last year's winner is Ryan Lewis. I think Justin hit the nail on the head. Some of these drivers are going to be uh, car wrestling a little bit for the first couple laps, trying to keep these cars, keep the power underneath them. 
once once we get going we see that green flag run uh, we're gonna see some green flag racing here tonight that but we'll see when it transpires and how long it transpires for and as the drivers as well you know what were they expecting out of this one is we take it around for some pace laps before we get underway and they got a couple of cars spinning gifts and some yellow flags as well so they think it's going to be a rough and tough of night of action see if that means starting up front's going to prove dividends you see the 83 is Zelensky outside of the front row he's your points leader through four weeks of competition he leads atop Keegan Leahy Garrett Lowe and Ryan Lewis at 3-4 with Crowder Davies Ottinger and Al Falla through P8 if the regular season were to end tonight, those would be your playoff drivers. Though keep in mind, we still have 11 weeks of regular season racing to go. Uh, so no need to panic. However, as we get into the middle portion of this season, uh, if you find yourself at the outside looking in, it's time to shift it into gear and to figure things out. The pace truck's going to be diving down it in this time. As always, happy that you're spending your Tuesday night with us on the iRacing Esports Network. The field's going to be in the hands of the Coke Energy Toyota Camry. It's a home race for the Richmond Raceway Esports driver of Jimmy Mullis. The field's going to be in his hands at a turn four as we say let's go racing from Richmond round five the Coke series is green and we'll see a fight for second to one for the first time Mull is clear here comes Clampett on the inside of Zelensky Everybody trying, everyone is trying to scrap their way along that bottom side. You can defend a little bit on the top side in middle line compared to what we've seen at Bristol in the last short track. But you do not want to leave that yellow line along the bottom of the corners. That's why so many drivers are already trying to find a hole and find that space they need to have them at third line. A real shallow entries by the likes of Nick Ottinger. You see his Logitech Gene Williams uh, entry. I guess it should say the William Byron Esports entry. Make the move on Alex McCollum as the top six or so have single filed things out. Mullis leading comfortably. There's the battle for Zaka to clamp it in Zelensky with the 99 winning out at the moment. And there on that static shot, you see all the two wide back throughout the pack. The first battle, Tim's pick, Mike Conti side by side with Colin DeKeister. That one could be for seventh and eighth position. In Turn four. Yeah, Keister and Ottinger swapped a little bit of paint off the start, Evan, and Keister lost a couple of spots, and now that fifth third bank, number 17, falls back a little bit. The eight of Michael Conti trying to roll the top. Gets a little close there in the middle of one and two. Conti going to try to clear him for the position. Will do so and move up one more just behind them. The six and the 90 are going side by side. It's Nathan Lyon and Zach Novak. Novak trying to do the same thing that Conti just did and take that top to one more spot. He is, well, the second representative for Richard Raceway Sports. You're on the board with him and his Sudoku entry. He's got the track tee on and, again, hoping to have a good showing tonight. Side by side with Lion for the battle of ninth and 10th. But he is stuck up on the outside and it seems pretty uh, calm, cool, and collected up there. He's uh, trying to pinch the sixth car down. Actually getting a good run up on the outside of the racetrack, Justin. But it is going to be very difficult to, to get around that sixth car. And as it looks like now, Lion may have the advantage. If I'm Novak, I'm looking for a gap but a Casey Kerwin next car in line probably not too acute on letting that happen we'll see yeah absolutely at this point as we take a look at Jimmy Mullis up towards the front was talking with both of them earlier today both of them felt Mullis was very comfortable this racetrack he's shown good speed here at Richmond in the past he's shown good speed right from the get-go or when he was some early clean air looking very nice and calm when you start up the front like he has tonight it puts you in that situation where you control your own destiny and as long as he keeps it consistent and clean, he's in a good spot for the early part of this race. And you can see all wheel movements as well there, Tim. What we're used to seeing for these drivers at this level of sim racing, and it's the same in the real world as well, is limiting those wheel movements. Smoother is better, but just to mention that uh, these cars are going to be a little bit loose, and they always say loose is fast, so even the race leaders up there kind of wrestling these cars a little bit, trying to stay right on that edge, and also right up against the fence there, as up front it single files out a little bit. And Logan Clampett trying to reel in that 46 of Jimmy Mullis for that top spot about three tenths of a second between those two. And you said it throughout the, the top 10, top 15. You see it right there as we look back to the Mode Motorsports number 24. Uh, about halfway through this pack, you start to see a little bit of two wide racing, but these guys may be content to ride right now as we work around on lap number 10, albeit it is early as Jake Nichols looks ahead of him, sees Brad Davies, Ray Alfalo, there's two veterans of the series. You got another battle on your screen, Alex McCollum, great qualifying effort. Looks like he might be losing a spot here though. 
Anthony McCollum just got teamed up on as Michael Conti and Colin DeKeister both went to the inside on his number 54 G2 eSports Chevy. So they were able to pass him. Here's the onboard look with him as he falls to position of her seventh driver out of Phillipsburg, New Jersey. He's got the likes of Lyon on the bumper and you can see the battle for the race lead kind of off and on the horizon as in fact the intervals at the top of the screen will prove Logan we'll clamping a little bit better than Jimmy Mullins the last couple of times around. It's only been by a few hundreds of a second here or there. But he is making a convincing uh, challenge for the race lead as the top two try to open up a gap over Zelensky. Remember, it was Clampett using the inside of road two to make the pass on to Bobby, who qualified in second right off of the get-go. And he's pulled away from him now, now trying to put the heat to the 46. Yeah, Clamp has shown some really good short run pace early on in this race so far. The concern, though, is the more you push on the short run, the more tougher it will be for you in the long run. Many competitors in discussions and preparations for tonight have been mentioned. They felt like if you're faster lap 30 on, that'd be the prime spot. Drivers who might be pushing early on might end up being good on the short run. It would be curious, though, to see how much the speed compares to, as well, Ashton Crowder, his teammate, trying to fight Sherbert. We were talking a little bit earlier about that set of the boot trying to get up and through the field at Ashton Crowder now in full spot once another one there's the on the board look with him is and some more aggressive chops on the wheel trying to chase down Shearburn uh, Crowder was able to make a move on in a couple of laps ago to get up and into 14th position uh, but unable to touch Shearburn thus far who has been holding pace at uh, 13th position on the racetrack which is exactly where he started and the concerns were Tim Terry that this might be a little bit of a, a rough and tough of one off of the start but I know it's early, 15 laps in, everybody doing a real good job of keeping it under control. I wouldn't want to jinx it just yet, but it looks like we're seeing some great green flag racing here. And, you know, looking at Ashton Crowder, he's kind of letting that car roll into the corner and the center off. Uh, looks like Chris Shearburn might have his number, but right on board with Graham Boland, there's one of the rookies in this E-NASCAR Coca-Cola iRacing Series running in position number four. Kind of all by himself right now, a little ways up to Bobby Zelinski and about eight car lengths or so back to Nick Ottinger. And, Looks pretty focused, looks pretty smooth on the wheel, and that 18 car looking pretty good. Qualified fifth, currently in fourth. Now you look back from what appears to be the leader, Logan Clampett is there on Jimmy Mullis. In this virtual space of iRacing, you can literally make any TV angle you want, any camera angle you want, and I think those shots off of the nose and then off of the bumper are some of my favorite. You could see Logan Clampett was lit that time through. The race leader is now working in lap number 19 of 200 and they continue to put gap on the car's third on the back but if you're Logan to clamp adjusted it seems pretty self-evident that he is the faster car not gonna matter first caution to flag of the night there's a couple of them making a mess down into one and two and I believe the 47 to Jeremy Allen's the one who got tagged yep absolutely him and Garrett lower though drivers are getting involved but I think that situation is one of those where Eventually, you have to figure out, are you going to make a pass after five laps behind somebody? Clampett looked like he was ready to try and give a bump, maybe get Mullis a little bit off the groove, try and make something work there right before the yellow flag. While others were just content on saving tires, saving the right rear tire, trying to make sure they weren't getting too loose, and being patient. But now, everyone's ready to come down to the pit lane, it appears. Yeah, we're already seeing uh, some tire fall off there of a couple of tenths of a second off of the hot laps. The race leader is going to be down to the pit lane. And, of course, uh, Jimmy Mullis leading us down. Going to have the benefit of going all the way down to pit stall number one. But can anybody else pull something out of this? Tim would expect maybe four tires to be the call. I mean, early in this race, if you're going to take a gamble, it might be the time to take it now 20 laps in. It depends how hard you were really pushing to try to figure out what you had in your race car. That pace truck out there is very lonely because everybody else is down onto pit road. It looks like for the most part, your drivers up front are going to play the safe bet, Evan, and take four. And you can see the car is getting jacked up in a pit lane. Clampett tried to make it close, but I think Mullis 
stayed in front where that line is. That would be the benefit of the number one pit stall. Clamp it better off of the pit lane, but there it is. Mullis first to the line, and therefore he will maintain the top spot on the racetrack through the first cycle of yellow flag service. So we slowed things down. They're going to catch up to the iRacing.com official pace truck. So off a little bit of a different pace car here uh, for this fifth round of the competition. And uh, Mullis is going to be comfortable up front. Now Clampett, though, going to be on the reverse end just of the move he made early. And it's even going to be amplified more by the restart procedure. The control car gets to dictate where do we go from the pace car dives down to where the green flag actually comes out from the flag. Man. And the big thing to keep in mind is when the pace car is diving in in three, that's a big window. Clamp it past the second place car by starting behind the leader. Now he'll have to hope that Zelensky doesn't return the favor. Yeah, and the interesting thing when it comes to being able to control the restarts here as that control car, though, too, is you have to think about do you try and go early and try and get yourself a couple car lengths distance into the corner so you enter it smoothly and half. Drivers have to reel you in for four or five laps. Do you try and hold them up a little bit? Try and see if you can stack them up for some mistakes in the mid to backpack and go like that. It's kind of some of the things you talk about with your crew members, with your crew chief, with your strategist, and kind of think about yourself. What's the right move for me to be able to get this start done properly? Jeremy Allen got uh, bumped by one and dumped by the other of the Wood, Ra or Wood Brothers racing the cars. That was the caution flying for early in this one. And we're going to get set to rate uh, back to it. Pace truck going to dive down it in. Mullis, familiar spot up on the front row. But again, watch that potential battle for a second as we come to the race start zone. Green flag flies. We're back underway. And it was not a great jump by Zelensky. Clamp it. Going to come down for P2. He'll defend second as they race off to turn one. We'll see if that top side has any oomph like it did off the initial start. Third place going to be Bobby Zelensky. Graham Boland still hung out on that outside line. Ottinger takes that peek to the inside as you ride on board with the leader Jimmy Mullis. Looking back at the pack in behind. Little bobble from the inside from Ottinger as it looks like Graham Boland going to try to still take that spot on the outside. Lead representative for Joe Gibbs Racing is Interstate Batteries Toyota holding up Colin Keister though right now. Two of the Cup Series teams represented in the field as now Keister's going to move down to the bottom. Mobola and Helen Strong, so it's McCollum down to the bottom. Side by side, this battle on track, I think, for seventh position. It's actually going to be for six and seven. Bullen had the nose at the line, but again, JP, that top side not going to hold. McCollum's got it. Here comes Keister on a yellow behind the race leaders. Yeah, but 97 Golinski, Ken Cook involved in the back part of the field, it appears here, Evan. And cautions, precautions is the same when it comes to short track racing. It's been like that early, and this was something some of the drivers expected for tonight. Some quick yellows, potentially a long run, and then the rest of the race, may, may it lie, so to speak. And I don't really know if it was, uh, you know, a, a lapse of focus or what. I don't think that was really an incident that I would consider, uh, you know, avoidable. Um, and the fact that it was just a racing deal, it kind of came to nowhere. I don't think anybody was uh, a little bit overzealous. Kane Cook was uh, three wide. As we take a look at the replay, you're going to see the 10 car go up the hill of Justin Bolton. He's actually going to get the fence off of turn four right there, comes down on the 97, and then that's how Kane Cook gets tagged. Then he just ran out of real estate and Bolton misjudged that turn, Tim, just a little bit there, and that's a quickly it pops off. The 55 had nothing to do with it, but of course, he's the one that goes around. Luckily, both the spinners in Kane Cook and John Gorlinski didn't really hit anything, so no harm, no foul, besides losing track position. Your race leaders not coming down to the pit lane, while a couple of the cars towards the back of the pack do. Yeah, now you'll have an opportunity to come down and maybe get that thing massaged a little bit, seeing that you're at the back of the pack. John Gorlinski, one of those drivers we mentioned off the top in the Tim Facts that have been here for a while, started this race uh, in 2010. He's got a couple of podium finishes out of this racetrack, but coming back to the series in 2020. Great to see John Gorlinski here with that William Byron eSports team. But he's got some work to do now as it's lap number 28, and he's going to be mired in the back of the pack. And... Uh, some comers and goers through this pack looking to see where Ryan loses. Your guys' pick is up to position number 19. He's been doing some work already. 
And I was not really comfortable with that qualifying effort. Of course, uh, you know, uh, we have to submit our picks uh, before race day for the our booth fantasy. So we can't wait to, until the, uh, you know, the, the qualifying session happens and then figure out, uh, you know, who we want to pick from there. But, of course, race winner here, winner of the, uh, the last two out. I think that he's got a good car. I just don't know what really just it, he missed in the qualifier session. But uh, for both the mine and your sakes, uh, we hope he continues to march through the field. And when you have quickie yellows such as this, it kind of opens up the strategy window, though, as well, to try something different. Some drivers I talked to mentioned there could be as much as 10, 15 laps where drivers risk staying on oil tires. They might be good the first 5, 10. Then the time balances out. Then the speed falls off at lap 20. You kind of have to weigh that out to think, can you get track position and get yourself some good luck? Drivers like Luza, drivers like Rugia, or amongst the drivers who have already tried a two-tire strategy to Pure 7 to try and gain that valuable track position in the past couple pit windows. And it was a short run, so I think the two-tire window is open. Of course, if you gamble on that just a little bit, you hope that this isn't the green flag run that goes 50 or 100 laps, uh, or you would be at a little bit of a disadvantage. We'll see how the strategy plays through in this one. The pace truck going to be down and in this time through. Let's go on board a little bit back in the pack with Zach Novak. He's going to be P11. This is going to be his view for the restart for the inside of row number six. Pace cars off. Green flag flies. We're back underway. Zach Novak through the gears and up into corner number one this time. Middle of the pack. He's got Nathan Lai right ahead of him. Christian Chalner on the outside. Top three way up there. Gets single file and now he's going to Trying to slot in underneath Casey Kerwin in the 23. Look at that focus as they go down the back straightaway and follows that Oscar Meyer number six. And correct me if I'm wrong, Justin, I didn't see him reach uh, for the H pattern shifter. So I think Jimmy might be utilizing the paddles to get up and through the gears. So you can keep both hands on the wheel at the same time. I race it gives you the ability to kind of do whatever you want with your wheel and pedal set. And I think that's an interesting decision by the 90. Yeah, it's a pretty interesting decision indeed, but it's one where it's one where you need a lot of grip at this racetrack and it, it's a handful to try and hold on especially to keep position in battles such as this for second and third spot so i don't blame him for going with that, uh, that strategy for tonight to try and maintain both hands on the wheel to make sure in case the car steps out at any point he can try and wheel it back into into control so he's back there dealing with traffic your race leaders are not we are single file through the top eight on board now with Michael Conti, who's been working his way forward up to position number five. Uh, fun dynamic duo here. You talk about the Junior Motorsports uh, car and Conti, of course, owned by Dale Earnhardt Jr. And, uh, of course, his uh, affiliation and association with Hendrick in front of him. It's the William Byron car, but a yellow. Put that on to pause. It is more cars in the back. I think Garrett Lowe this time involved in the 21 machine. He was part of an earlier incident, and this time I think he is one. Yeah, Garrett Lowe, it's just not been his day so far, I have to say, Evan, so far. Two incidents involved in. At this point, if you're a driver, you have to calm down, especially in this caution free constant situation, where regardless of where you're at at the field, because if you allow yourself to get anxious, to panic, that's where you get sell yourself into more trouble, and the more you get yourself into trouble, Evan, the more likely dropping back. And with the second look at all of this happening, it actually looks like it starts with Phil Diaz in the 75, check it up. There's the 21 onto the brakes, and then he gets tagged from behind by Sheehan, and that's eventually how Garrett Lowe goes around. Tim, uh, you know, big enough shoes as is, stepping into a Wood Brothers car, but of course uh, stepping in for Ray Alfala, who piloted that number 21 ride spin Ford last season. And, you know, Garrett has had uh, a pretty impressive showing, I will say, showing a good bit of speed. Uh, so far this year, but uh, unfortunately not the uh, ninth that he wanted tonight for round five as uh, he's at the back of the pack where a lot of cars are again designing to pitway race leaders opt not to again. Yeah, Garrett's had a couple of uh, top five finishes uh, leading into this event, including last week or the last time we were out at Bristol Motor Speedway. Currently sits third in the point standing, so it's been a great season for him, but Right now, it's starting off a little bit rough here at Richmond, but still have plenty of laps to go here. Working lap number 37 as the uh, pace truck on the racetrack looks back, sees all the 
cars that are still there, and Jimmy Mull is doing a great job. Should mention as well, I got a message from Randy Chenneth, our uh, co-host usually here on the Tuesday nights, and he said that he picked Jimmy Mullis uh, to win this even before qualifying began. So, Evan, I don't know if we can count those as points or not for tonight, seeing that he's not here. He's under the weather. We wish him all the best. But uh, I don't know if we can count those for the, the booth points. Well, I have the, we're in that same group text, Tim, and he did not tell us that till about 10 minutes after the green flag, so I don't know if I'm buying it. I don't know if we can or not, but uh, he's under the weather. Maybe maybe he put it into Drew or somebody in the iRacing office. We're, we're going to have to get confirmation on that. We'll see if we uh, allow Randy to get some free points if he wants to cheat while he's away. Meanwhile, we're out here making the tough picks and hoping that our drivers uh, can figure things out. And, you know, Justin, on that point of fantasy points, let's talk real points. I mentioned it on the pace laps that Bobby Zelensky is the early points leader in this championship through four rounds. Without a trip to victory lane, though, the likes of, you know, Leahy, Luz, Crowder all behind him. Top eight cars with wins. There is no win and you're into the postseason in this EDAS car, Coca-Cola iRacing series so consistency more important and that's what the 83 has been doing so far yeah he's done exactly that was talking about a little bit about that today and what I asked him about the points lead he said it's more so just being able to stay out of the most trouble in the early portion of the season as well as the consistency goal of course make the playoffs and then go from there yes it's good to have a strong start at the same time as well Evan you have to think about this. If anything happens to you in, say, a few races, you have at least a decent cushion of about 13 points to back up on for the time being. A couple of the yellows here back to back has slowed things down. Let's run on board with Graham Bolin from position 11 as the pace car is off and in. Jimmy Mullis is on the gas. The green flag flies now working lap number 40. Clamp in blocks for second. He'll maintain with three wide towards the front as Novak right in front of Bolin there to the inside of McCollum and Keister. Novak slammed it into turn number one and two, and Colin Keister gets the wall on the outside of him. They are getting racy for about position number five. Zach Novak gets back side by side with Alex McCollum. The 18 of Graham Bolin sees the six, and Nathan Lyon to the outside. Evan, the top three, top four have this figured out. Everybody holds him behind, fighting for a spot. Well, that was the right call uh, from Drew and the team down at the production trailer to go on board with Bolin for that one. He had a great view of the restart as the 54 of McCollum trying to come across his nose. He gets that shut down now on board with Casey Kerwin, the Jordan-branded Toyota for Denny Hamlin Racing. Looking up at the back of the 32 of Keegan Leahy. Team Car as they run down on the inside right now and one is about to 11th and 12th position on the racetrack. The side-by-side -side only reaches from that up until that uh, bullet of a column duo as the 18 car trying to get clear and tell you what Justin they're not leaving a ton of room on the outside for those cars these guys pinching a lot and squeezing each other yeah they're trying to get them to get off the throttle on corner exit force them to burn up the right front tires and get themselves tight off the corners to try and defend and it was well executed by a couple of these drivers but if you're guys like McCollum you have to find a hole because he's starting to struggle up on the top side. A couple competitors set themselves up on the loose side and said, if you try the higher arc, you're likely one of those drivers that prefer a looser race car. And McCollum's not being able to utilize that because of how hard they're racing. Yeah, they were right on each other's door there. Him and uh, the 23 at Curlin, they both got a little bit sideways, but it looks like uh, that Casey now with the nose in front is going to bet on. And that watching the battle up at the front of the field. Still Jimmy Mullis, Logan Clampett second, to Bobby Zelensky third, Tim. There's really been no change up here since Clampett was able to chase down to Mullis on that first run of the race. But just when he got to the bumper is when the first caution to fly came out. Hasn't really had an opportunity to get back to him since then. The top three, top four are able to get into a little bit of a rhythm and kind of log some laps, get a spot in line, and run. You see some of these drivers back here. There's the 53 of Ryan Luza picking his way through the pack. Right behind him, the 9 of Eric Smith. He had a tough run at Bristol. You ride on board with Ashton Crowder in the 77, working his way up through the pack. Started in 15th, currently 14th, and chasing down Malik Ray in the 51 car. And just in front of them, Alex McCollum continues to fall a little bit from where he qualified 47 laps ago. So we're, even though with the cautions, Evan, we're starting to see some comers and some goers here. We are, of course, uh, your pick, Michael Conti, moving up a few spots, watching uh, the side-by-side -side action with the 37 of 
Christian Chaloner in the uh, Chevy up on the outside for JTG Doherty Racing, turning down in front of uh, the Steve Letart and the Letart Esports entry of Shearburn down on the inside. Love the dynamic of all of these different teams and cars in this series, and Challenger is going to win out in that battle. Slides down in line, and now the next side by side group. Not going to matter. Yellow, and again, it's going to come towards the back of the pack. Oh, it's Dylan Duvall and the 41 car, the Abruzzi Ford for Stuart Haas. Sports has gone around, and we talked about drivers pinching a little bit of contact there is all that it required after he got into it with Michael Gorilla in a battle for 30th position. Let me put it this way, Evan. If you end up messing up your line at all, whether it's corner entry, corner apex, you risk pushing up in the middle of the corner, and that loses your speed. There's also the risk of with how hard these cars have been squeezing exactly is that you're going to make door-to-door -door contact. Take a look at this on the replay. You'll see, tries to give a little bit of pinch. Greg, we're going to miss the bottom just a little bit. Bye-bye. The 41 machine goes around. They almost slapped the wheels there, and you can see the contact caused that 41 to bounce up the hill and uh, unfortunately goes around another pretty harmless spin. I'm, I'm sure you're just tired of the cars outside at the top. What a late dive! Jimmy Mullis to pit road, and Logan Clampett at the last second brings out Zelensky and Conti. So those three stay out, but then everybody else behind opting to dive to the pit lane. So a mixed bag on the strategy is Chris Overland going to join the about a half a dozen cars who stayed out? It's going to be an interesting strategy here as we go forward and see what these drivers do decide to take that are sitting on pit road as Jimmy Mullis in his box still working on that race car as it looks like he is not going to be the first one off pit road. It's going to be Colin Keister along with Graham Bolin and the 32 of Keegan Leahy then the 46 comes off of pit road so interesting strategy here up in front as the uh, 99 of logan clampett has that valvoline burton clicker mini sports car up front let's watch how late this dive is this is mike conti a lot of the time they say do the opposite of the race leader right there they all kind of were waiting for somebody to do that and once they got to the point where uh, Jimmy Mullis was unable to follow them, they dove back out. But it did not, Justin, convince everybody to do that. I mentioned we saw Overland jump back out. Uh, you got Jarl Tien up there as well. Blake Reynolds, the top six. But most everybody else came down pit road with a mixed bag of strategy. And I don't blame them with how many short runs we had so far. They risk if we get a long run to fall off. But also keep in mind... At least the top three drivers off the pit lane, Keister, Bowen, and Leahy, all took two tires trying to get track position. Many others who are in the middle of that Hornets nest we just seen also did the same thing like Shearburn and Schaliner. So this is a gamble for some of these drivers hoping that it stays in this way. But at the same time, if it works out, you gain a lot more track position than you had just about five minutes ago. And let's see if the lights go out on top of the paint strike this time through. They do not. So at least one more trip around is uh, some of the cars uh, still, uh, you know, get their service. We saw a wave by, uh, I think, to John Gorlinski, the 97 car to get back to the lead lap. And I guess, Tim, per the trends, we're seeing the yellows that we expected to see. But, you know, we've, we've still got all 40 cars in the race. We're, we're having spins. We're not really having wrecks. Yeah, you saw that spin with Dylan Duvall was able to keep it off the wall and, you know, come down, get that thing massaged out a little bit and resume your racing. When uh, Dylan Duvall, after Bristol, said he had one of the best cars he's ever driven here in the NASCAR Coca-Cola iRacing Series and was pretty pumped up about the car that he had tonight, but he's going to have to work from the back of the field. There's a nice shot of the field from turn three and four as they come by this time. The pace truck light should turn off and should be back to green momentarily, but... We're used to seeing cautions here at Richmond, Evan, uh, just maybe not in the rash that we've seen. Uh, the And I don't want to say this because I know Jacob Seelman's already said something on Twitter. The record amount of cautions for this race is in 2011 when we had 19 cautions. I don't think we're going to get there tonight, but uh, we're starting to rack them up. We are, and this uh, series has changed immensely since uh, 2011. Of course, if uh, you know missed the pre-race coverage, this track has been on the calendar every single year, all 11 seasons of this Coca-Cola iRacing series. It looks especially nice tonight, though, due to the hard work of everybody back at iRacing to give it an art update and bring it up uh, to 2024 as uh, for tonight's competition. The pace car down off and in for the first time tonight. It is race leader Logan Clampett. Green flag in the air. Here comes 
comes Conti though. Zelensky side by side for a second. Is there a three wide behind him? Yes, indeed. Keister trying to force it right underneath URLT and to try and gain track position. Very risky move early on, but it looks like they've sorted themselves out. But already seen a couple of these drivers push a little bit off the yellow line of those who stayed out. Could make it difficult for guys like Tina to hold on with the fresher tires behind. And you can see 0 for 2 down for Bob Zelensky when he starts at the outside of the front row. And it may be worse than that. Conti is clear. Here comes Overland through as well as you see Keister and Reynolds doing the battle. The team Dillon management up number 3 Coca-Cola. Car up on the outside is let's go on board with him. As he's in the mayhem first time top 10 after he started 35th. And he's working that outside line. The only driver on the outside right now is Chris Overland. That 83 as Zelensky was able to slice down in front of Yarrow Tian to pick up a spot. And now you see that 17 of Colin Keister getting ever so close to the back bumper at Tian as you ride on board with Blake Reynolds. That inside line seems to be the place to be. There's Jimmy Mullis working his way through the uh, pack right in behind that number three of Blake Reynolds. And if you wonder, for Blake Reynolds, who started so far back at the pack, he gets to a top 10 spot with the older tires. You know, how is the 35th place car able to hang on like this relatively? Top 34 cars in qualifying were separated by less than two tenths of a second. Basically, snap your fingers two times in a row. That's about the interval between 34 of these cars in qualifying. But the disadvantage for the three is the fact that he's on the outside of Graham Bolin. The 18 making the move on that preferred lane is going to complete that pass, get on through, and now you're getting into the cars with the fresh rubber as Chaloner goes to try the same. Yeah, remember Chaloner's one of the drivers on two tires trouble. And a spin as it's Jarl Tien in front of the field. The caution flag is out. And I think somehow the 66 car, despite being stopped in the middle of the racetrack, did not get touched by anybody else. It was contacted battle for fifth and sixth position. Tien left the door open just a little bit for Colin Keister behind him. And there was contact Tim that sent him around. We'll get a second look in just a moment. Yeah, we probably should have stacked up about 15 cars right there, but we set it off that last caution flag. It seems to be single car spins as we look at the replay to see what brought it out. And Evan, as you mentioned, Colin Keister takes a little peek to the inside. The 66 of Jarl Tien is there on that inside. And looks like the 17 just rolls in a little too hot and just barely gets into the back bumper of the 66. And everybody goes to avoid. Matt Busa was close in that number five car to getting into the 66 as they avoid it. The yellow flag flies once again, and uh, Jarl Tien will have uh, to get back to the front of the field. Was up there a little bit with pit strategy, but now he's got his work cut out for him. 62 laps into this thing. It was so it down once more. That time, uh, you know, we had kind of mentioned that a lot of these incidents were coming from the back of the pack, and instead that one uh, in a battle up towards the front of the field. But how about the moves? Of course, Logan e. Clampett opted to stay out, and that's how he took over the race lead. But again, Bobby Zelensky, not a fan of being on the outside for these restarts. He got passed both by Michael Conti, who's now in second, and Chris Overland, who started a P25. One of the drivers to stay out. He's now up to third. So a lot of drivers making some noise here. And this is exactly what the drivers who stayed out wanted to have happen if you can maintain the track position. Be in a situation where eventually everyone's going to have to come down for more fresh tires. You don't want to be in the case where you end up being a couple tenths off the pace by 20, 30 laps into a run, and then you're the driver falling behind and struggling to maintain apex speed along the yellow line. So that was the gamble they played. It's been working so far. But for drivers like Zelensky, I've got to be worried about drivers like Keister who have shown they're willing to be aggressive to get to the bottom as quick as they can. And interesting to see that the race leaders this time through opting not to come down to the pit lane because now that we've kind of mixed things up and you know, you've got that group of uh, about five or six cars that stayed out to him kind of off cycle. If you have a race like this where it's kind of stop and start, yellow, green, back and forth, and you really don't get long green flag runs, that you could kind of eliminate a pit stop just by topping it out a little bit as the lights go out on top of the base car. So we'll see if the next time they all eventually decide to come down to the pit lane, will it be a roll? reversal or will this stay out strategy especially for somebody like Overland who is back there in the 20s you know if he can maintain a top five spot it would really pay off 
We'll see what we get for green flag runs, Evan, at the end of this race. In the last quarter, I think we really start looking at it right now. We just got to get there first. We got to get some laps in, and hopefully, obviously, the greener laps go a little bit quicker than the caution laps. So we'll see if they can log some laps here as we get ready to come back to the green flag. And up top, we'll keep it down, and you can turn it up as we enjoy the sights and sounds of the virtual Richmond Raceway as Logan Clampett's coming to green. A good restart there for the likes of Clampett and Conti up at the front of the field as they're able to hang on. Some of my favorite shots and all of that is kind of that virtual visor cam where you basically get the same view as the guys behind the wheel in their homes, in their sim rigs. The battle for second, though, is on. It is Chris Overland inside on Michael Conti, and he's done it. Move the 16 car up to P2, and Keegan Leahy not done with the 8 Chevy. And it looks like Leahy does have a little bit of trouble though with that front nose. Keep an eye on that. That might overheat the car just a little bit on this run at the end of the straightaways. It does have a bit of back end damage. It's kicking up that spoiler. And that's going to also make it a little bit difficult in terms of how the downforce distributes on the car. Not too much of a worry on the back end. Just got to make sure you have a little bit lower tape if you're Keegan Leahy at this point. It was a couple of the cars that were beat up. We were on board with whoever was behind Ashton Crowder. Saw that the back end of his Burton Clicker Mini Sports car was pretty junked up. But again, it's short track race, and you can get away with a little bit of that. And we're looking at a great battle back in the pack. The four of Santiago Tierras on the inside of Nathan Lyon. And a couple of cars in the mix here that have had some issues tonight. The likes of the 47 of Jeremy Allen. And now just getting back up to the position in which he started this race. You've got the five of Matt Busa who we were going to talk to about a little bit earlier until we saw the yellow flag fly. All of this going on the low 20s and some blocking some drivers swerving on the back straightaway trying to maintain track position. A lot of fast cars though back here in the mix due to the uh, exchanges on cycle and the opt you know, I guess the different uh, opinions on strategy but somebody that stands out to me is Ryan Lewis in the 53 car in this area as he's driven his way up to 14th. Now we look further towards the front of the field and we go on board with Jimmy Mullis. He rides in P8. Yeah, this battle for around position number five where Jimmy Mullis is has been getting intense. Keegan Leahy overshot turn three and four a couple laps ago. Went up the hill. There was a couple of quick three wide maneuvers. He was running in the top five and now he's dispatched outside the top five. Jimmy Mullis made the move and now Zach Novak to the inside of the 32 as you continue to ride on board with Mullis looking at Casey Kerwin to the inside. Almost a little bit of contact there as well. Now you ride on board with his teammate Zach Novak in position number eight. Uh, <laughs> These guys are quickly picking up some positions, uh, but Evan, I've been watching that Keegan Leahy car on the outside. He overshot the corner a couple laps ago. Uh, Justin had mentioned could be some overheating issues, maybe with the nose on that car, the way it's pushed in, and he is falling like a rock. Loses one more to Colin Keister. Here comes Alex McCollum. 
And one thing that we've been talking about when we were there on the fan immersion, Justin, as well, talking about temps, is that the track temp went down a little bit, still a bit cooler than where we started as we see McCollum down to the inside of Leahy in a battle for 12th and 13th because of the iRacing dynamic weather and dynamic track. When the sun dunks behind the clouds and it gets darker, track temps do trickle down just a little bit, and all of that affects how much grip these guys have to work with. Yeah, the grip levels are going up because in part with this cloud cover. Keep in mind too, the more these drivers turn laps, the more rubber's placed down on the racetrack. The more rubber that's placed down on the racetrack, the less fall off there can be. Some drivers were estimating in single car runs in the preparation for tonight, up to a second and a half of fall off in the span of about 50 laps. Right now, the fall off from the start of the runs are running for some of these cars up to six tenths of a second. And something's wrong, guys, with Bobby Zelensky. I don't know what the issue is, but the 83 car is going backwards. He started second place in this race, but the last two laps, he's just gone to the very, very outside of the corners, way up and into the marbles and into the dirty stuff. And he has now scored P30 and is continuing to drop. So big, big issues with Bobby Zelensky. And it may have to do with some front end damage on that car. Doesn't look awful, but again, may be concerned about those temps, as we mentioned, is uh, he's gone from a contender to really struggling just to stay in this race. Now on board with Malik Ray, he's going to drive it in right to the bumper, that number 23 machine of Kerwin in front of him. You see that 51 car getting close to the back bumper of the 23, battling up there. Inside the top 10, this is the battle for position number 9, and now position number 8 is Michael Conti on the outside trying to make something happen with Ryan Luza. Luza on the inside, Conti trying to hold that outside line. The 23 of Kerwin continues to go to the inside, and Jimmy Mullis is hungry. He's got that Coca-Cola Energy number 46. Up on the back bumper, Christian Chalner and Chalner in turn, looking at the Valvoline 77 of Ashton Crowder. That's the bat battle for position number three as they come out of corner number four. 82 of laps going to be in the books next time by and make it 83. And that is uh, the battle, as you mentioned, for third on the racetrack. Well, through all of this, uh, a battle for the race lead may not be that far away either because Chris Overland has closed things in just a little bit, trying to chase down Logan Clampett at the very front of the field in the 99. And no, you're not seeing double. Those are the same Valvoline cars. One's the 99 at Clampett. The other is the 77 at Crowder. And they're running real nice right now, first and third, but they are both under fire. And... Of course, Chris Overland would love to park it into victory lane. Justin Prince in this series 16 times in his career as he finished inside of the top five, but has yet to park it into victory lane on a Tuesday night. And that pitch strategy calls really made this an interesting race for him. Yeah, it's made it very interesting here, but you've just seen it in turn one and two. Some of these drivers, despite the fact they were gaining about a tenth a lap in that train, are getting a little impatient. Some of the Richmond Raceway Esports machines giving a little bit of bump and runs now to get by drivers such as Chowder on the two-tire strategy. So they feel like the benefit is more so if they make the pass on, say, Chowder, than trying to stay behind and be patient to try and close back on down from the 99 and the 16. Now Chowder has to play defense to drivers like Luza and Kirwan. Yeah, Chalander, one of the four international drivers in this series out of the UK, joined by Jarl Tien from Norway across the pond, and Keegan Leahy and Dylan Duvall from north of the border. Uh, so four different international drivers, 36 American drivers in this 40-car championship. And I think Ashton Crowder is really going to have to push here to keep Bolas behind him. Not only Tim, does you know, he want to stay in that spot, but if he were to get past, he'd get passed by a whole host of them. Now on board with Chris Overland in second, who is all over Clampett. This is the battle for the race lead as we start to close in on halfway home in the Richmond 200. Yeah, that 16 car of Overland looking pretty sporty here early in this one, getting closer to that halfway point as the Wood Brother 16 takes a peek to the inside, side by side for the lead, going down into corner number one with the 99 of Clampett to the outside. Close quarter racing, little sideways for Overland, trying to get a little bite off the corner, and he's going to sail it on down into turn number three. New leader, Chris Overland in turn number four. They all just about touched, but that battle for the race lead has allowed that group third on back to close in. So Overland goes to the point for the first time tonight. 
but here comes Jimmy Mullis. He made the move on Crowder. So did the Donnie Novak. Oh, here comes the 53 of Luza with a dive bomb on Challoner behind. So all of these drivers making moves. You're on board with Mullis in third. So yes, Overland happy that he's gone to the point just at Prince. However, I'm not sure how long it's going to last because not only does Clampett want it back, but that 46 is fast. Here he goes to the inside. Mullis looking for second. And Mullis put in almost 2,000 laps in preparation for tonight to try and get his speed to where it's showing. Well, there's a reason he's one of the fastest race cars. And Novak, he also felt like he found some speed in recent races. And that's now showing despite the fact his goal was just to get a good points day. Now, he's in position to get a great run here. 108 laps to go with a chance to follow his teammate to the front. And you've seen these onboard shots. We've seen a lot of crazy sim rigs over the last couple of weeks with the Pro Invitational Series and drivers for the top levels of NASCAR competing. But a lot of these onboard shots, it's just a steering wheel on a desk. Goes to show you that you don't need crazy equipment to be one of the best sim racers on the service. As here's Mullis now to the inside of Overland. The battle for the race lead at lap number 94. He started up front. He's back up front back to the lead Jimmy Mullis makes the pass and teammate Zach Novak following him through he'll try to clear Chris Overland he does and from the virtual Richmond Raceway it is Richmond Raceway Esports now first and second yeah but they can't rest because here comes the 53 of Ryan Luza Luza won here last year he's won the last two races in this series he's moved his way up to position number three right behind those Richmond Raceway Esports teammates now the battle is for position number five. Logan Clampett led a lot in this run, but now he's falling back. Christian Chalner, what a run to the top five. Casey Kerwin goes to the inside as you ride on board with Ryan Luza, trying to reel in those top two, those teammates. Look at Novak able to roll that thing to the inside, and that thing absolutely cut in the middle of the corner. It's going to be a great battle up here between those two teammates, I'm sure. And now we wonder, Justin, you know, how are Mullis and Novak going to navigate this? Because if Ryan Musa, who started 37th and did make some two-tire calls, but didn't take a big swing at the strategy like somebody like Chris Overland did to get this track position, if he starts to close in and Mullis may be holding up Novak, does he let the Dundee go? Do they race each other out, which may allow that car in third position to close in? These are all things they need to be worried about. And somebody else who's worried was that 99 car clamp it up top on the board with Michael Guest, who's making the pass on his inside. Oh, in contact! The 99 is going to get tagged! Logan Clampett goes around. Caution at lap number 98. And I was going to say he needs to be concerned because he's going to go backwards on the outside of three wide. But he really needed to be concerned after the sixth car. It looks like an eighth and Lyon went to the inside of McCollum, who pushed up and took the Donnie Don car out. Here's your replay. Yeah, it looked like that Clampett had no idea what was going to be happening underneath him. Tried to normally move to the middle line and then, bam, contact from McCollum in that three wide situation. Have to say, though, Evan, I don't think we were expecting the fall to be that dramatic. After 20 laps in a run, Clampett just fell off a cliff, and so did just about everybody else who had stayed out during after some of these caution flags. We'll take the halfway point to under caution flying conditions as we're back down to the pit lane. And again, Jimmy Mullis, Tim Terry has already used that number one pit stall to his advantage once and engine out Clampett. Let's see if the 46 can do it again. And race leaders looking for four. Justin hit the nail on the head again. You talk about the fall off on these cars. I think you come down and you take four tires here. Uh, everybody is on pit road except for maybe one lap down car. That may be Keegan Lay. He came down a little bit earlier, I believe, to maybe address that nose. He's currently scored as one lap down and maybe the free pass as the field is getting ready to come off a of pit road and we'll see who wins this race. Big race to the stripe and again, it is Luza who takes out the cone who appears to be the first car off of pit road. He had the speed, but again, I think based on the placement of that line, are they going to give it to Mullis or no? Luza staying in front again. It doesn't matter who gets off it onto the turn first. It's who gets to that white line, and I thought Mullis had it. 
but it appears that they're going to give it to Ryan Luza in the 53 car from a 37th on the grid and an atrocious qualifying effort took halfway, but he is now your race leader. And the crazy thing is, Evan, he actually accidentally drifted in three and four. That's what cost him so much time in preparation during warm-ups for his Q run. He would have been in the top 10 if he was able to repeat when it mattered. And it was talked about by some of the drivers, and you mentioned the differences in times. There are some drivers who spend entire days preparing qualified runs, knowing the importance of track position. Now, Luza, with the right amount of strategy and luck, is a plus 36 on the night. He's doing it real good, and we'll see if he can stay up front. Uh, I know that uh, up at the broadcast booth, it is uh, our job to be the unbiased look, but that's our fantasy pick, so I wouldn't hate it. Let's take a second look now at the race off of the pit lane to see how this shakes out, and right there to the white line, Luza in front. You know where the green cone was because he smoked it on pit lane exit, and uh, again, timing and scoring to get to give that one to Ryan Luza, and, and that is all uh, automated in the service. It knows exactly, of course, where the cars are. That's not a judgment call uh, by anybody up at the Tower. So that could be big for Luza here because it'll put him on the outside of the front row. Tim Terry, it could force, you know, Mullis and Novak to fight for second behind. And we know that the 53 Williams Esports car has got speed. He had to get through traffic. What kind of speed may he have if he's got the clean air? You know, you look at the top five, though, very intriguing top five right now. Obviously, Ryan Luza statistically is probably at the top of the board if we're looking at odds. Uh, last two races he's won. He's won here at Richmond last year. The Richmond Raceway Esports teammates running second and third. Chris Overland, I, I think he would dump his grandmother to win one of these races. It's been so long. Uh, he hasn't been to victory lane yet, sitting in position number four. And Christian Chalner, we saw him uh, put the boots on and go to work at Bristol in the middle of the pack there last week. So running in the fifth place position with Casey Kerwin to the outside. Very, fairly intriguing top five right now as we just crossed the halfway point. Only one of those drivers that's in the top five started in the top ten, and that was Jimmy Mullis who started on the pole. And he's going to be on the outside of the front road to control car Ryan Luza, who looks to lead his first laps of the afternoon. And the green flag conditions, right foot down, up through the gears. We're back underway. 97 laps to go from Richmond. Mullis, I think that Ani cut him a break. He comes down to maintain second. The fight's going to be between Novak and Overland for third. Some of these drivers in the middle of that three-wide hornet's nest, about 10th on back, are trying to door one another nearly to try and conserve that bottom line. But that was picture perfect on the start, though, for the top drivers to be able to quickly get into a rhythm and get themselves to the bottom for the most part. But remember, it's the question of what drivers would have in this track to work out if they stayed out about 50 laps ago. Overland showing that perfect example. He's now much higher than he was before. Remember, he was in the 20s before he stayed out. And of course, everybody now in the second half of this race would be able to make it to the end of this race on a fuel. But if we ask Larry McReynolds and he reminded us about the trends, chances are that doesn't happen. We talk about the yellows that we usually see here in Richmond and how the opening half of this race is gone. But just a housekeeping note, if it goes green, these drivers good to go the distance. You're looking off of the back bumper of race leader Ryan Luza back at Jimmy Mullis, who runs in second. Teammate Novak behind in third. Casey Kerwin and Christian Challenger the rest of your top five but you see the side by side further down the road that is ashton crowder battling with malik ray for seventh and eighth malik ray hasn't had the best of seasons outside the top 30 in points in 2020 and trying to get a little bit of momentum rocking in this series as he looks to the inside of ashton crowder who came into this race fifth in the standings you're right on board with nathan lyon right behind the 33 of michael guest michael guest has had some up and down run so far this season looking to uh, put an exclamation point on it here at the Richmond Raceway, but uh, some battles all throughout the pack. There's Matt Boos to the inside of Nick Ottinger, and uh, that's just outside the top 10, sitting about 15th place or so. Yeah, so further back the road, you see the side-by-side -side battling is uh, going on in front of them as well. It's going on behind them, so well, there's tons of action all throughout the pack here as everybody tries to get things sorted out. Ottinger unable to clear on the outside of the racetrack as Boland continues to, to kind of be a thorn in his side. The likes of the sixth line battling closer to the front of the field. That Malik Ray Ashton Crowder battle still going on as they argue over who's going to get seven. Now the not of Eric Smith got moved up the hill further down the road. So there is battling top to bottom. One of the beautiful things about Richmond. Absolutely 
and I've seen in some cases drivers be able to run side by side for 20 plus laps. That time though, the 77 of Crowder nearly bobbled his way into the door of Guest. Good save on his part, but a lot of these drivers, I think might be overexerting their tires here. The more they fight like this, the more difficult it's gonna be to run in a long run if we get one about 30 laps onward as Bolton tries to recover from one of his incidents early. Remember, he hit that right side against the wall. Yeah, he had an early incident, but the car looks okay. As he follows Conti. Conti down, going to go to the inside of Eric Smith in the 9 machine, the Jim Beaver Esports car, who we haven't talked much about yet tonight. He's the lone car up at the outside, as you see Busa, followed by Ottinger, followed by Conti on the bottom and a caution flag now at lap 112 and again it ain't anybody up front who's got the issues i see somebody slowing down in turn number four and i believe it may be garrett Lowe. oh no we talked earlier tim and kind of complimented him on how he had been having a very good night uh, but he got tagged in this exchange by jeremy allen Keep in mind, if you rewind to earlier in this race, the very first incident, Jeremy Allen got bumped by one of those ride spin Ford Mustangs and then dumped by the other. And I'm curious if now that the roles were reversed, if that was a bit of payback. And you know, if you look at the replay, it might be a little, if you didn't, if you didn't know, it might be incidental contact. But that, now that you mention that little piece of information, 47 to the inside and just a little bit of a tap just to send that number 21 around it it wasn't hard contact but you mentioned that little snippet right there evan of earlier in the race race car drivers do not forget they might uh, you know cash in the receipt or cash in the check a couple of races down the road or you might just do it later on in the show but uh, we'll have to keep an eye on those two as we continue on because there was no real wall contact they're still going to continue to roll yeah, now there's a simple spin, and we keep on going. Uh, it looks like we have a handful of cars, maybe a split decision. Cars deciding to stay out, and uh, maybe a dozen or so drivers actually opting uh, to come down to the pit lane uh, and get service. Of course, uh, that yellow uh, slows things down. And let's take a look at the replay. We saw some of these late decisions on pit road early. Check this one out on board with Chris Overland, who at the time was running to position number six. You see they all dive out, and it... He had a little bit of a second thought there, Justin, turned it to the right like he was going to follow them and then decided to hold it low. And all the track position that Chris Overland made up by neglecting a pit stop earlier is now going to right itself because he was the first one down. I think he might have hoped that a few more cars were going to follow him in when he went for that second fake scene. No one else had gone for the move to Seattle Racetrack yet with the leaders, except they got him big time on that as well. At the same time, if he bubbled it too quickly, Devin, there's a chance he might have just barely clipped those barrels, and those barrels hurt a lot to the suspension, to say the least. And unfortunately, uh, for some of the names in the field who we're not going to beat up on, we have seen drivers end up in the barrels already this season. So that is the risk that you take uh, when opting to come down to the pit lane. Uh, there is no kind of commitment cone for the pit lane. Uh, you can kind of dive out or dive in as late as you would like. The barrels will let you know, Tim, if uh, you're too late on that decision. Yeah, those barrels, as they are in the sim, are not going to move, and they are definitely not your friends. So you want to make sure that you're... Uh, nowhere near them when you're throwing those fakes uh, as the pace car lights still stay on or pace truck lights still stay on. Ryan Luza, Jimmy Mala, Zach Novak, Casey Kerwin has made his way back up into the top five into fourth. And Christian Chalner in position number five. Malik Ray having a great run there as well in position at number six. So we're just past the halfway point now. The, the comers and goers we really start to see. We'll see what kind of pattern these caution flags have uh we saw a green flag run there just before the halfway point we'll see if these drivers can get back into a rhythm it seems like these front guys know how to get single file and know how to log some lap seven the guys at the back are uh, still fighting for those positions and they want every piece of real estate that they can get there's a lot more take back there rather than there is give they, they absolutely do, and Chris Overland, who was the first car down at the pit lane, is going to be way back in 20th position 
for this restart as the Lance go on top of the base car. He'll be back with uh, Eric Smith in the Bernine Ford, the Big Green Egg Ford. Shout out to, as well to, to the folks over at Big Green Egg for hosting the uh, the Media Mayhem racing uh, last night, uh, which uh, I did not do uh, great, but I didn't do horrible, but it was uh, a ton of fun. And I know we joke up at the booth about how we uh, avoid racing on the iRacing service uh, and we'll let the pros do it. Uh, but that was uh, a lot of fun. And you can see that number nine, uh, Big Green Egg Ford back of the back. So big thanks to all of those folks uh, for making that event happen. And uh, we'll see what he and Overland could do because, again, that is the benchmark on the fresh tires. Let's look back up front and take an onboard ride with P3 Zach Novak. He's already got to catch up because Ryan Luz is gone. Absolutely nailed the start, it looks like, to be able to get on the bottom. His teammate giving him the space. It's just a matter, of though, of making sure he keeps in mind what's going on behind him. You see right there, the glance up towards the mirror. Just got to keep an eye on what's going on. Make sure you know how hard you have to defend if you try to have to match the pace behind or if you get luck of a side-by-side -side battle holding up the drivers behind. You can see how close up to the inside wall they hold it. The top three are single file. First battle is with Christian Challoner and Casey Kerwin. Almost contact from Michael Guest behind the Team Dillon Esports driver in the beneath the Chevy Camaro ZL1 Wen LE, I think is what we're calling it for this 2020 campaign. There's a couple of cars into the fence behind Blake Reynolds. Got a piece of the outside wall. We're three wide with Kane Cook down to the inside. The 77 a Crowder in the middle. All of this battling going on just inside of the top 10. Yeah, Kane Cook going to pick up two spots there, move up a little bit closer to the front of the field and set his sights on that number 51 as you ride on board with the Renegades number 55. Just ahead of them, you see Casey Kerwin battling for a spot. Michael Guest all the way up to P number 5. So the train works around to the inside. And oh, by the way, guys, driver knocking on the door of the top 10. Ray Alfala sits in 12. The guys led a few laps here at Richmond, working his way up here in the second half. And the underboard jot uh, with him, as you can see, looking up at the back bumper of Malik Ray. He's gone a 40 at tonight. So all those big movers, Tim kind of stole my stat, Justin. I always like to bring out that who started top 10 that runs top 10 thing about every week. Only two cars who started inside of the top 14 or so actually run still in those positions. A lot of big movers, only two top 10 cars still maintaining those spots. As Jeremy Allen's got a front row seat for the four, Santiago Tiraz, the NBC track pass machine to the inside of the fifth third bank. Ford up top, that is Colin Keyser. And this is a mixed mind shoe of drivers on new tires and drivers on old tires amongst that grouping. So if you're the drivers on the newer tires, you got to be patient. If you force it too much, as some of these drivers already had, you risk contact. Overland really trying to force the issue underneath Allen. And you can see that he's got the run off of the corner, but not quite clear. The 47 keeps the nose up there, so Overland's going to have to try it again. Again, on those fresh tires, trying to lead this charge. And how about a driver as well that we haven't talked a ton about? Corey Vincent, the driver out of Louisville in the 27 car, started 38th. He is now top 20 in this uh, group of six cars side by side, more tightly packed together than most of the field was for the last restart. Yeah, just past the halfway point, he's up about halfway through the field and continues to work as he's got Santi Tires on the outside in the four car. They go side by side for that spot. There's Nick Ottinger, a driver no stranger to victory lane here, chasing down Eric Smith. He's got the 47 of Jeremy Allen to the outside, kind of has that car pointed towards the outside as they run down the back straightaway, working lap number 127. And Ottinger has Conti to the inside, Michael Conti trying to get his way back up through the pack and right behind them another driver trying to get back up there Bobby Zelensky, Graham Bolin those names we saw in the first half of the race running up front they're mired in traffic right now yeah, those cars that the outside uh, really struggling to be able to get the upper hand here is as we kind of take a look back towards the front and you can see uh, single file with a good bit uh, of separation. Uh, but, you know, Luza is not able to get away. We question that maybe he could have been the fastest car tonight. We just didn't know because it was back in traffic. He's good. You know, he's race leader good right now. And, uh, of course, the race winner from this one back in 2019, looking to not only go back to back at Richmond, but looking to go three in a row here in 2020. Winner of the last two, Bristol two weeks ago, and Homestead the week before that. Um, but the 46 of Mullins keep it a bonnet. So is Novak. Challenger, he's kind of unable to get away. And John Gorlinski, but a lot of traffic up the road. We'll see if that is a factor at all. 
Yeah, gonna be interesting since Grulinski does have a little bit of damage in that Chevrolet Camaro for William Byron Esports, but that's the difficulty of, say, being in traffic like Eric Smith. You may feel like you have a good car in preparation practice when you're by yourself or with a couple teammates, but once you get to the real world race situation, that's where you're really tested on. Can you find a way to somehow get your way through traffic to put yourself in a winning position? That's where the talent of a race car driver, the confidence to get through the field comes in, as well as squeezes such as that a little bit for monitor to be able to get by drivers on older tires. You can see Santi didn't have a lot of room up there on the outside as the 25 squeezed his way through to make the move, but he does uh, do so uh, to win out for 24th and 25th position. A lot of beating and banging in front as Eric Smith and Nick Ottinger, or the 47, sorry, of Jerry Allen with the two cars. I think there was a little bit of a bump there. The 9 moving the 47 up the hill. He'll get down to the bottom of the racetracks at the Jim Beaver Esports Ford on the JTG car on the outside line and again when you get the bottom you're pretty much good to go so Smith gonna make the move and here's Bobby Zelensky the car who started in second it was a top five car for a lot of the night lost a lot of positions a while ago he's back in this traffic in the 20s the battle that you're looking at right now up front is kind of where that car deserves to be that's where he was for the most of that first half a little bit of lap traffic up ahead. That might be John Gorlinski ahead of the leaders as the 53 of Ryan Luzic continues to lead this field around. The two Richmond Raceway Esports teammates in behind and Christian Chalner has made his way up. There's a couple of veterans of this series. How about the two of Ray Alfal and the BRS car on the outside, the 88 on the inside, the true timber car for JRM Brad Davies going side by side. These two have been here since the start of this series and they're putting on a show right now for what is going to be position number 13 as you Right on board, in behind, where you see Brad Davies right up ahead of him, Corey Vincent, you ride on board. And hello, Nathan Lyon. Lyon to the inside, Michael Conti there as well. What a battle. It's a great fight right here, and we haven't talked much about Ray in the number two VRS machine much tonight, but you can see he's going at it with the Davies. The six-car Lion has kind of been all over the racetrack tonight. Conti, Vincent, the other two cars in this group of five, and... Brad Davies, who started 29th, wins this battle. 13th position is all his. So let's go on board with the four-time champion and three-time Richmond winner. Ray Alfalis said earlier today, Richmond is favorite racetrack. He's doing good, but is still unable to crack the top 10 uh, after he started way back in 32nd. Justin, tonight has really been a night of historically fast cars at Richmond struggling in qualifying. Yeah, absolutely. Some of these drivers had some bad luck, as we talked about. Some of them have been able to get the track position, though, with the way this race is played, exactly how some of them have wanted. But this is now getting to what we've seen the last time we got a long run. The drivers who stayed out at the front of the field starting to fall back a little bit by about two to three tenths a lap. And those older tires are falling off, including teammates now passing one another. Yeah, both of the Junior Motorsport Chevys side by side, and uh, as expected, you know, with the boss man, I'm sure, tuning in, they keep it orderly. And uh, the eight car Conti is going to beat out Davies for that spot. The 27, of Vincent, though, going to be the sandwich in all of that because his Ford Mustang comes through the middle, uh, and he'll split up that duo now as they run 14th, 15th, and 16th on the racetrack 16 laps to go though this time by working on a pretty good green flag run as we hop forward with keister in position number 20 you can see alfala another teammate battle ray alfala bobby zelensky side by side right up the road zelensky opens that door to the inside of his teammate to pick up the spot graham boland right in behind him and nick ottinger in behind his completed right on board with colin keister and you now look back from Jimmy Mullis to Zach Novak. That's the battle up in front of the battle for position number two. And Christian Chalner not too far behind the Cottonell number 37 as they work around within the top five. They'll come by this time and complete 142 laps around this racetrack. Getting closer to the end of the race and getting closer to that point where you really have to start taking a little more if you're up front rather than giving. We saw a lot of it out back earlier in this race, Evan. I think we're going to start to see it up in front as we closer to that 50 to go mark and so much love for the folks over at Richmond Raceway of course playing host to, to tonight's virtual race you'll see the NASCAR Pro Invitational iRacing Series here this upcoming Sunday on a Fox and FS1 the big thanks uh, to track president Dennis Bickmeyer for 
joining us pre-race. They've got two very good drivers, and we talk about the uniqueness of the teams in this series. You know, uh, you know, some of the cars sponsored by NASCAR Cup Series teams themselves, actual affiliates, uh, some of the esports orgs. But super cool to have a track involved, and they're showing real well in second and third position as we hop over down to P11 and Ashton Crowder on board with him as he's trying to hold off the six car and Nathan Lyon who's slipping and slotted behind him and Crowder with a bit of that uh, front end wrinkled up the back end's beat up we saw that earlier all signs a short track race and Bolin now somebody else who last time we checked in a bit after starting to be fine was doing a whole lot better right now trying to make a move on Eric J. Smith and he's going to tag him he gets it into the 9 and the 83 Zelensky hangs on are they going to wreck behind no what a jump by both those cars to save it. A little bit too aggressive from Bowen, have to say, but an impressive save. Both drivers really had to be careful to get back on the gas to make sure they didn't snap. If he made one mistake, that would have had trouble. Speaking of trouble, it's going to be behind them. Caution to flag is out. Keegan Leahy is. At a rough night tonight, Tim Terry, we uh, touched on that a little bit earlier, comes into tonight's second in the championship. Two top fives and a win in his four starts so far this season. Uh, but he gets sent in a battle for 34th and 35th position after he had some assistance by Brian Schoenberg in the 79 car. So a tough break for those drivers who were nowhere near the action up towards the front of the field. We'll try to get a second look at a moment, but your race leaders are coming down to the pit lane. This could be for the final time. Coming to 52 laps to go, Ryan Luza got the race lead with a pass on pit road. Can he maintain it? With the way this, way this race is played out, Evan, I wouldn't be surprised if this is the final time they come down. We've seen some green flag racing. From here on in, if we do see some cautions, it might be some strategy. Do you come down? How long is the green flag run? This is going to be a very key pit stop, and looks like it's going to be a key pit stop for almost everybody as that pace truck out in front. Maybe one car staying out as Jimmy Mullis comes down and hits his box. And just as he hits his box, Luz is already done with his pit service, having uh, the 37th the stall from the end of the pit lane. And because the pit lane's curved, watch this. You're going to see Luz come around the corner. He's going to be hugging the boxes on the inside. Shortest way around, takes out the poor cone again. And Luza maintains his track position. He will stay first on track. Mullis second, Novak third with Challoner and Guest. The rest of the top five. I am seeing, though, Jarl Tien as the only lead lap car who opted not to come down to the pit lane. Now we'll get the replay of that incident that happened at the back of the pack. Now you can see Schoenberg thought he had a run with Leahy having a rough day, trying to set it in. Leahy comes in for the defense, then boop. I think it was a little bit harder than Schoenberg might have wanted to try and move Leahy off the groove. But in turn, caution flag waves, and that bails out the drivers who have to save the cars too, where it really would have heated up their tires and potentially made them struggle for about five laps. By the way, here on TM, he's the only person, as you mentioned, Evan, who has stayed out on the racetrack. The question is, uh, will the Norwegians stay out on the racetrack and uh, opt to go for the race lead in this one? Tim, funny enough, something that we talked about pre-race, drivers weren't really sure you know, how the tires were going to act on this over the variously length runs, but if he was just hunting for a bonus point, I think he would have already dove down to the pit lane. He started 14th, he has some speed, and he is going to go to the race lead. So Jarl T in first time tonight, the G2 Esports Chevy to the top of the board and again the even bigger implications of that is that it'll put Ryan Luza who had been in cruise control mode since going to the front of the field to the outside of the front row opening up the bottom for a possible challenge by Mullis on the restart. I feel like our contemporary up here Randy Chenneth would say that's probably a bad call out of the 66 with everybody else coming on to pit road and him staying out on the racetrack but it's getting the G2 esports team a little bit of publicity and a little bit of camera time up in front but you got to remember that Yarl team was up here a little bit earlier he was up in the top five so we'll see where he can run against these drivers with brand new tires on their race cars uh, we'll see what uh, see what transpires here about 30 laps the difference in between the tires on Yarl Tien's car and the uh, tires on the rest of the field and at lap number 115 the last time we were under caution the Yarl Tien 
opted to come down to the pit lane. So uh, he did get tires the last time through, but of course, when we've seen drivers skip a stop, it has been on some of those shorter runs. It has not been on a run that went about 35 laps in distance. So we'll see what he can do. And if he feels like the clean air is going to be the remedy, that solves it all. The pace car is going to drop it down and in. We're going to have 48 laps to go tonight for the Virtual Richmond Raceway. Round 5 of the 2020 EDAS Car Coca-Cola iRacing Series. Green flag. We're back underway. Here's the fight for a second, though. Mullis on the inside of Lusa. Oh! Oh, there's going to be big issues behind. Challenger gets tagged, and it is a parking lot in turn one. I don't think we're expecting that from that part of the field. It just seemed like everybody wanted to duck to the old line and try and make a near 3-4 wide oven. That doesn't usually work at Richmond on the restarts, and I think how many drivers we've seen involved along that outside wall shows the exact example of that. Take a look at what just transpired here on this replay. You've got Casey Kirwin and Malik Ray both wanting to go three wide, and then Calamity. I think Malik Ray flashed the nose to Kerwin first. That's why Casey went down and effectively in just trying to block Malik Ray ended up doing the same thing to the 37 car a challenger that Malik Ray was, you know, or that he was concerned that Malik Ray would do to him. And not the first time, Tim Terry. We've seen a mess like that at Richmond down into turn one. We've seen it in the real world as well, and that's part of the D-shaped oval is you kind of got a rider high down into turn one and it leaves that inside line wide open. Let's go on board with Jake Nichols for this one and you're going to see all the incident. It's way up in front as he's back in the 30s. The top of the racetrack is blocked. He decided to go high and that was the incorrect decision to wreck avoid. It looked like he was trying to go high. He had some drivers behind him in the rear view as well that were going the same way. So a uh, tough break there. Said about 15 laps ago, we're going to have a lot more take than we do give at the front of the field. I think that's the first incident that we, we've we really seen, multi-car incident at least, in the front of the field. We've seen a couple of single-car spins that could have been multi-car incidents, but man, oh man, it's getting to the end. These guys want to get that track position, and they want to make sure that they keep it for the run to the finish. Jarl Tien, though, stayed out on those old tires. He's still up in front here as we work with 45 laps to go. That move could end up paying off here. Yeah, so Gast involved in that incident, obviously. Chris Overland, fast, fast car. Tell me if you've heard this tale before. Uh, fast car, run it up front in an incident. Not going to be able to fight for the race win. Challenger, Kane Cook, Casey Kerwin, the 77 of Ashton Crowder also involved. Uh, Conti got a little bit of damage in that one. Of course, we saw uh, Nichols get involved. The four car of uh, you know Santiago Tires in the 32 machine. A lot of fast race cars that we talked a lot about tonight involved in that one. And Justin, really, at no fault of Jarl Tien because he was fine up front on the old tires. Had a really good restart exactly what I thought was going to happen did with Mullis coming up the inside of Luza making a fight for second he completed that pass but of course with the yellow coming right back out now it's a roll reversal Mullis will be on the outside in second Luz is going to be in third let's go on board with Kerwin as you can see he goes to the inside of the 37 again I think he wasn't really trying to go three wide he was just trying to block the car behind and in effect it ended up being the guy dive bombing I think in theory it was right, and at that time he was entering the quarter, he was probably hoping that a spotter was telling Challenger, there's a car on the inside, leave some space. Unfortunately, just everything happens so quickly where you have maybe a couple tenths of a second to respond, or try and react rather. There wasn't enough time to react if for some of the drivers who are already trying to sort themselves on top, and we've seen the results of what happens when you have to try and maintain position, not leave the bottom open, and in turn, fight hard. By the way, track temperature, cool. It's, it's been at 92 degrees. So, and you can see visibly not as many shadows, cooler as the sun is dunked behind the clouds. And with the rubber down on the racetrack as well, you're probably going to have more grip now than you have at any other point tonight. Does that make a drivers a little bit more brazen? Lights back out on the pace car. We'll try it again. 42 laps to go. Jimmy Mullis going to have to try to hang on for the outside of the front row as the field is in the hands of Jarl Tien again. Green flag flies. We're underway. And here's Luza up the bottom challenge. Challenging for second. 
50, up, or 53 shoves a nose down to the inside as the yellow flag is back out on the speed. So that was a quick little run there. The yellow flag returns to the racetrack and Jimmy Mullis has a time to uh, take a breath, maybe take a sip of Coca-Cola energy for the, the next restart, which will happen with less than 40 to go. And I'm thinking the 47 car here of Jeremy Allen had to have uh, missed a shift or something. I don't know what the issue was. Uh, he was super slow. Chatted with him a couple of weeks back at the Guy Racers Lounge podcast and got to learn uh, a bit about him. And I mean, he just did not go off of the quarter just and missing a shift is really the only logical explanation uh, that I can think of. And you're hypothesizing maybe that instead of getting up and into third, he put that thing in neutral because he did not go. Bolton in the 10 was behind him who checked up and it was just a big accordion effect uh, that sends Garrett Lowe around. A uh, rough couple of laps after the 21 started the night so well. Absolutely, and it's actually fairly easy to accidentally, while you try and shift up, hit, say, a teeth of your gear shifter or, say, accidentally slip off and go into neutral. And in turn, you ha it takes a couple seconds to get it unjammed to be able to then shift up or shift down from that specific gear. And in turn, Allen ended up getting tanked from behind as he tried as hard as he could to get back going. And many of the air competitors didn't realize there was a car that couldn't get going and was in trouble. Yeah, they uh, they did their best. But of course, when you're on the bumper of the car in front of you, you have, uh, you know, very limited reaction time to be able to respond to that. And, you know, Justin had kind of alluded to, Tim, a little bit ago that you're hoping uh, in the earlier incident that your spotter is telling you what's going on. At this level of sim range, you know, when we say your spotter, we mean your spotter. These guys have, you know, kind of a, a pro spotter or somebody that spots for them and serves as the person on the top of the virtual tower every week with them. They're kind of looking up the road, letting their driver know what's happening, uh, where to go if an incident breaks out and how to get out of the way. And uh, unfortunately, in uh, those last two incidents, not sure how much help they could have been uh, just with uh, a couple of bad luck incidents. Everything happening so quick here. You have to really make that decision. And uh, you might not have to rely on the spotter as much as it happening right in front of you. And you have to try to stick handle that race car around and uh, get out of an incident and try to pick up a couple of positions at the same time. But now we're under that 50 lap to go, Mark, as these drivers pace under the caution flag. Yarl TN strategy looking pretty good right now if we continue to get these very quick uh, caution flags. Jimmy Mullis, Ryan Luz, Zach Novak, Malik Ray. In the top five, great to see Malik in the top five. We'll see if he can uh, get up here and try to make something happen for a win as we uh, take another look at the replay here. Yeah, we'll get a second look at all of this happening. And there's the 47. He's slow. They check up. They check up. But I think that was uh, Sheehan who got into the back of the 21 machine and turned to pour low around. And again, uh, I think that uh, had shown some promise early. Uh, complimented him on how coming into this race, round number five of the season, that Garrett Lowe was third in the championship. Uh, but that only put him, uh, just taking a look at the points, I think that was only uh, about 27 or so points actually ahead of P8, which is the playoff cut line. Uh, so you finish in the 30s or whatever it ends up being for him after a rough night. Uh, and he could see uh, a big drop. We've talked a lot about Jeremy Allen tonight. He just had one rough week out last time and dropped from 12th to 20th in the standings. Have everybody with such tight margins, Justin, it is difficult to get away with a bad week, even though you'd think a 16-week regular season is plenty. Absolutely. And one of the main things as a driver when you have to think about this is you have to be as consistent as you can in when it comes to the regular season. That's what your goal is as a driver. The more rough races you have, the tougher it is to make the postseason. But take a look at the upper side of your screen once again. The clouds are continuing to settle on in. The day continues to progress. Guess what? The track continues to go down, and that means, say you had a looser setup at the beginning of the race, and you might have been very, very loose wheeling the race car early on, Evan. Now, you might be in the neutral range tonight. And I think everybody had been on the loose side, so these cars get to tighten up a little bit as the track temp has dropped more than 10 degrees. You can see the bottom lane of the racetrack darker than the top, just like in real life. Rubber gets put down there. 
that's where the grip's going to be. You don't want to be up top and into the marbles because you get up there, you can lose grip. You can actually see the marbles stacked up against that outside safer barrier, all in attempt, of course, to make this as close to its real-life counterpart as possible. So we'll try it again. Jarl Teen in control. Watch the battle for Bullis and Lusa for second. We're going to go on board with the Grand Bull and P11 on the inside of row number six. Green flag flies. A check up up front as Tian took a shot from Lusa. This is going to be a great ride down into corner number one as Graham Boland tries to enter the top 10 on the inside. He's got Nick Ottinger to the outside. Ray Alfala is looking in behind the 25. Come on. They come off and yellow flags out. Yep, caution from behind it. It is Alex McCollum. So very opposite ends of the spectrum for one of the G2 cars up at the very front and the other one turned around in the mid pack and... What we've talked about three wide so far tonight, gentlemen, when we get a second look at this one, we'll show you why four wide does not work at Richmond. And uh, fitting that I just mentioned the marbles because Alex McCollum, when you're the fourth car up in line, you kind of have to pinch a little bit because if you leave, you know, that much room on the bottom for three cars to safely fit, you're up and into the marbles and, and you're probably wrecking either way. I'm not even sure he knew uh, that there were three lanes of traffic down on the bottom uh, and it was a little bit of a, has, uh, a half hazardly uh, spin, uh, you know, up and into the outside of all. Uh, another incident where, you know, could have been worse. That battle was uh, in the 20s, uh, but he uh, spins out and uh, he'll be okay. But, of course, not what he wanted. The big thing is, at the time of caution, look up front. Ryan Luza did have a nose on Jimmy Mullis. So musical chairs again for second and third as Luza now back onto the front row. Should note that Jarl Tien also had a ton of tire spin on the bottom of the racetrack off that start. And that really caused a bit of a checkup sequence that you talked about with the bumper being given. That's the risk you take, though, when you're on as old of tires as Jarl Tien is. He's kind of stuck in this situation. There's a strategy call now where if he comes down to the pit lane, he might not recover the vast majority of the positions he had all night long. So he's made his bed at this point. He's going to need to, to hope that he can somehow hold on to the bottom of the racetrack and keep the track position as, much, as long as he can. And of course, uh, we told everybody up at the top of the show who we thought was going to go to victory lane. Uh, Justin and myself picking Ryan Luza, who is in second. Michael Conti, P7 on the racetrack right now. Uh, we encourage you to let us know who you think is going to win this one by using the hashtag EatAskar. Here's a second look, though, at the restart. Real slow for Jarl Teen. You can see Luza once, twice, a shot to the bumper. Again, Teen can decide when we start. So I don't know if that was Teen hanging in the back or Luza trying to anticipate the start. And then here, Tim's going to be the four wide where the incident happens. Yeah, here's the mess in the middle of the pack. There's three, and there's about four right there. And... It gets tight going down into corner number one. Matt Moose, a little bit of contact to the back bumper of Alex McCollum, and that will draw the yellow flag. Alex, as we mentioned, was running up near the front of the field early in this one, had a great qualifying effort, but now he's got a long way to go from about 33rd place to get back up here with going to be less than 30 laps to go when we go back to the green flag. But you mentioned it, Jarl Tien, uh, he had the uh, prerogative of when to go and let that field go a little bit longer and, you know, try to avoid the tire spin. You see the last pit stop on the scoring tower, and it's it's his prerogative to uh, decide when this field goes. Maybe he'll switch it up and go a little bit sooner on the next one, try to keep this field on their toes. And, of course, Teen opting to skip uh, the pit stops at lap number 149, 148, in which basically everybody else uh, decided uh, to come in. And we kind of figured just outside of that fifth to go window uh, was going to be the last trip down to the pit lane. Uh, but you can see how much longer Teen's been out there. Yellow flag laps aren't going to weigh at the tires as much. Uh, but a big thanks to everybody down in the trailer for, for getting us that info. The likes of uh, Alex Horn, Cisco Scarbusa, Drew Adamson, uh, James Pike, Mike Taylor, Sean Ambrose, Tim Burns, Gary Weaver, everybody behind the scenes making this possible. And uh, we'll see if Jarl Tien can continue to ride this wave now inside of uh, 30 laps to go from Richmond. Again, the battle for second may be the big one here because that could be who decides to get the first challenge in the shot at the 66. Should we get some green flag laps in? Pace car down. This time, Tien goes early. We're back underway, and here comes Mullis on Luza. Much better start for Jarl Tien this time. The trouble's going to be, once they get to turn three, how patient does everyone on that bottom be? 
Will they try and set it underneath? Will they give up a bump? Yes, Ooh. they will give a bump. That was a huge shot to Tian. Oh, and Mullis is going to get turned. Jimmy Mullis in front of the field. Caution, a flag is out. New race leader is Ryan Luza. My, oh, my. And a glancing blow there from, I believe, Justin Bolton as they try to go too wide underneath that spinning race car. And Jimmy Mullis, who ran up front for most of the evening, sat on the pole. Randy Chenis pick tonight is at the back of the field. And we'll see the replay, Justin. You had a question, was there going to be a shot? And there was a big one right there, a huge shot to Tian, who had to get onto the brakes earlier. And just by getting into the back of him, it checked Mullis up. Lose, I don't think, really lifted for him. Just held the line on the bottom. Just got the left rear quarter panel. And such, such a good night for Jimmy Mullis. is going to go to waste there as that Coke Energy car got turned sideways in front of everybody. The interesting thing is when I talked to Jimmy Mullis earlier tonight, he felt he needed to improve on driver error. There was a bit of that error with that bump because you've seen it, how much speed he was carrying into that corner, Evan, to give that shot to the back end of Tian. It was so much that it left that door open. And drivers like Alusa at this point of the race, they're going to try and take advantage of leaving a hold like that, especially when they feel like you might slide up to the middle line by corner apex. Lewis tried to take advantage of the mistake, and we've seen the result. Tough show uh, for Mullis, who wanted to obviously represent Richmond Raceway Esports uh, in this one. Now we'll take a second look on board with Phil Diaz. You're going to see it all break out in front of him. There's the car sideways in front of the track. Go higher, low, just with enough room to get down and through on the bottom. Uh, again, the 46 could have been a lot worse than that, but it doesn't matter. In the final 30 laps, you get turned around like that, uh, and you may be SOL. The big surprise, Tim, though, I thought that at the moment of caution, that certainly Ryan Luza was the race leader. Him and Nathan Lyon, if that stayed green for another five seconds, would have both passed Yarl Tian and have been first and second on the racetrack. Instead, the yellow came out almost just as Mullis got sideways. And in iRacing, you do not have to revert back to any scoring loops. It is exactly at the moment of yellow. And uh, Yarl Tian credited with being in front at the moment of caution. So he stays, maintains P1. And again, would set up Luza for a P2 restart, maybe dealing with the challenge this time from Nathan Lyon, who assumes third. These are the two things working in favor of the strategy from Yarl Tian. That is on the inside of the six to the restart. We've seen this dance between Luza and Mullis. Now it's going to be Luza and Lyon. They really didn't help each other there because, again, when you're side by side for second, Yarl Tian's getting away. You need to ASAP and maybe, dare I say, give him a little bit of a bumper shot down into three if this is going to happen because Yarl Tian looking primed to ride these yellows out, make this pitch strategy call work, and go to victory lane. You had it right on the nose, I think, exactly, and that's why Mois, I think, went for that bump and run so quickly. It was just a matter of he ended up pushing too much and had to go for a later arc because of how much speed he carried at that time. If you execute it well enough where you're able to still hold on to the old line, force to Jarl Tian up to the middle line in three and four, I think that might be a potential winning move tonight. If you don't execute it right, we have a repeat situation of what happened about 15 laps ago. So you have to play it smart and calculated to be able to do it properly and be able to make the move cleanly without wrecking yourself or wrecking other competitors. Since 2018, Jarl Tian, who drives for G2 Esports in this 2020 EDAS car Coca-Cola iRacing Series, Tim, has started some 32 races as one pole, four top fives to his name, looking for a trip to victory lane. Could it happen tonight? It could very well happen tonight, but if we get to the point where we have a couple of green-white checker finishes, he's going to have to hold that lead for two laps and he might have to slide that car around a little bit to try to play a little bit of defense compared to offense. Nathan Lyon on the outside looking pretty good too, trying to spoil the party. Michael Conti is back up in the top five as well. He's sitting in position number five, Bobby Zelensky. Some of these drivers that ran the middle of the pack for most of this race, ran up front earlier, are now back up into the top five, or knocking on the door of the top five as we move forward here in the final 20 laps of this race. It's far from over. There's a lot that could happen. We saw it with Jimmy Mullis uh, having to fall back through the little incident that happened there, but 
There's still lots of laps left. There's still lots of uh, excitement to happen here at Richmond as the lights are still on that pace truck. They'll come by this time and finish 183. Yeah, and as we question, is it going to go green this time by Jarl Tien is hoping that, again, every single lap that we stay under caution fly conditions is a big win for him. The lights, though, have gone out. So we'll do it again this time. It's going to be with 16 laps to go. And again, I don't care if the cars at the back of the pack are going to be taking each other out. If you're Nathan Lyon and Ryan Lewis, I think someone's going to have to take a gamble here. You cannot afford to keep fighting for a second while the car on 35 lap older tires than you drives away. So who's going to pony up and get a good restart, make it happen? Although we've seen what happens if you try to guesstimate when the 66 will go. Meryl Tien's going to mix it up when he decides to put the right foot down. We'll see if that is a factor still on this one. Pace car down it in. 16 laps to go for the virtual Richmond Raceway. Green flag flies. We're back at it. Lose it, though. A little bit of a slower start. He'll still get to the inside of the six. Malik Ray wants to go three wide. He's not going to do it. The fight's for second. Yeah, line didn't get the best of starts on the top side, but thankfully for him, Novak took it much more smarter. Ended up being more patient, elected to keep it too wide. Now it's just a matter of maintaining a rhythm and getting clear for second. So then in turn, you can focus on trying to battle with the 66. Thing is though, Lion, he's still insisting on trying to push hard. Yeah, you can see Luz is so much better up and off of the corner. Is he going to be able to clear it out down into turn number three? Does Lion fight or does he try to get a line ahead of Michael Conti? It's going to be option B. He's now in second. Luza going for the race lead to the inside of RLT in. Side by side for the race lead at 13 laps to go. And it is Ryan Luza on through. Back to the lead for the 53. Lion going to make a pass for a second. He'll follow him through a car length and a half behind. And how quickly does Yarrow fall now? The eight car of Michael Conti to the inside. He's kind of boxed Zach Novak up on that outside line. It's allowed Bobby Zelinski to get to the inside. Malik Ray, Blake Reynolds all lining up in behind. Conti will escape with position number three. Caution is out. We knew Tita was going to struggle with the green flag laps. You saw it there. The spin is in the back with Dylan Duvall the second time that the Abruzzi Sim Race where Ford has gone around. This time it was off of the nose of the number 75 mode motorsports entry of Phil Diaz. A little bit of three wide run amok uh, in a battle back uh, for 16th position on back. Here's the second look at your iRacing replay. And you can see a bit of staggering. They weren't all door to door three wide, but just enough of a nose there. The 41 kind of running too wide when the three wide had the run and he gets tagged, turned around. His, uh, his SHR teammate in Bolton just about clipped him on the way through as well. And we slow it back down with a new race leader for the first time, Jocelyn Prince, at about six, seven restarts. And that is Ryan Luza, who was able to make that pass for the race lead. He's now on top as we pace with 11 laps to go. And there was a reason I thought he was in a decent position. We talked about the race trends and the Tim facts about how some of these trends have gone. For the past couple years, you've had drivers win two Richmond races in back-to-back -back years. Loser though, he's got to focus on defense now. He's got a fast race car, but it's been shown that many competitors in this field are even with them on the short run. I would keep an eye on that eight machine still because I wouldn't be surprised if he tries to do something on the bottom side, if he can keep it side by side with Nathan Lyon off the jump. Richmond Raceway Esports uh, on Twitter uh, saying that they're not going to be sending the Christmas card uh, to the 90 or the 66 team of RLT anytime soon. Of course, T uh, was uh, in that incident with uh, Mullis a little bit earlier uh, when he was in a position and then they made contact. He eventually got turned. He was holding up Novak that time through. And through all of the chaos, it is Ryan Luza who started in 37th position for the Williams Esports entry out of Cypress, Texas, who leads this race. Nathan Lyon behind him in second position. Position, the challenger going to be on the outside of the front row. Watch for Michael Conti, though, Tim from third. Yeah, you look back to Yarrow T and hanging on in position number four right now with Bobby Zelensky right in behind him in position number five. We talked about Zelensky and that eight car of Michael Conti hanging out mid pack or so and now working their way back up into the top five. Zach Novak, your reigning series champion, running in six with Malik Ray in behind them and, and uh, 
Evan, you still got some drivers in the top ten that could make something happen here. There's Blake Reynolds in the three coming to the front. Short track, if we make a mess on one of these restarts, we already saw uh, the big one strike down at this end of the racetrack in one and two a little bit earlier. If that were to happen, anyways, uh, you know, all the way back to Corey Vincent, P10, any of those top 10 cars, really anybody in this race uh, would be in a position uh, where if it gets ugly and you find a hole, uh, you could possibly be the driver that uh, is, you know, stands to benefit and tries to kind of be the shocker and, and win out in this one and, you know, for Ryan Lewis, uh, scrubbing the tires, he's going to have to be good. And now he has to hope that what happened to him happens to the cars behind. And that is that they get hung up in a battle for second position. Michael Conti up to third, though. How about Bobby Zelensky, Justin, who was a top runner early, had issues, fell outside of the top 30. He is in P5. At one point... There were drivers that were at some point recovering from two laps down. Take Michael Garigua. He's now up to 25th position. Got a couple lucky dogs with some of the yellow flags. He's now in decent position to get some points. Talked with him earlier tonight, Evan. His goal, try and get to the top 15. And depending on what happens about row two on back, I'd say, uh, he might be in a decent shot to get his goal. Will it be for the final time tonight? Pace cars get a dive in, and we're going to take seven laps to go for the virtual Richmond Raceway. It is Luza on top, outside of the front row. Nathan Lyon going to come side by side at a turn number four. Green flag flies. We're back underway, and it is a great start for the Oscar Mayer Ford. He immediately tucks in line second as they fight behind the race leaders. That battle is for position number three as the caution flag will fly once again. They'll slow them down the back straightaway. And it was Ray Alvala who came into tonight to eighth position. You remember the rough year that the four-time series champion had last season when he wasn't able to maintain top 20, got relegated down to the Pro Series, came into tonight in a playoff spot. Gets tagged by Bob Bryant, 42, at least the second time tonight, JP, we've seen that 42 car push up and get somebody, and this time it's Alvala. Yeah, I think it was in part seeing Sheehan check up a little bit and it just allowed drivers to get underneath in that situation and if you allow anyone underneath you on this track Evan people will take advantage take a look at this replay drivers trying to dive down to the bottom side and then you gotta be a if you're in the midst of traffic be aware of what's around you and he was able to through it. I mentioned, of course, the car that went around, but then kind of after that, there were more cars uh, that went spinning uh, as they all tried to kind of avoid the, the mess that Ray Alfala up on the top of the racetrack. Uh, I think it was uh, the 42 who came down and actually collected uh, Santiago Tires, who collected Brad Davies, Jimmy Mullis, gets more damage uh, in that one as, uh, you know, you add insult to injury and we look high to wide above the virtual Richmond Raceway. Uh, we're going to be right on the cusp of overtime. This could be a de facto green to white checker, depending on when the lights go out on top of the pace car. Let's go on board, though, with the two as he gets sent for a ride. Ray Alfalva down the front straightaway and trying to log down what would probably be a top 10 finish here, but everything happening, he has to try to stick handle that race car going around, hitting the wall, and now he's got some work cut out for him for what might be a two lap dash to the finish. And, Evan, looking down the, the list of Tim Facts that we have here, the longest running race, obviously all these races prior to tonight were 200 laps. We go to green-white checker, that would push it past the, the schedule distance, which would make it the longest race lap-wise. The longest race runtime-wise, one hour, 57 minutes back in 2011. We talked about that race with 19 yellow flags. Our runtime right now is going to be about one hour, 44 minutes on the clock. At 146, 146 would be the second longest race back in 2012. So we're getting to that point where we're trying to, you know, set some records. Might not be the best record to set here this evening, but uh, we're also getting there. So the patience we saw earlier in some of these race cars have run out. The uh, they might run out even more here as we might get a green white checker finish. Might even be uh, less than that. We'll see if it does have to get pushed it into overtime. If we were going to get uh, kind of that de facto agreed by checker adjusted in regulation, lights would have to been off that time. This next time by, uh, if we get the lights off at 199, that would already be two to go. So this thing may be going to overtime. And there were a couple drivers who actually theorized a little bit on 
would happen with a green-white checkered situation. The first of three attempts coming up here, Evan. Many drivers were thinking, what happened if, say, someone stayed out? I don't think they were theorizing Tien stayed out with 50 to go, but it's still a factor for second row on back for the top line to try and deal with, and that might mean a gold rush of drivers trying to find their way to the bottom line through three and four. And, and keep in mind, too, of that, too, on the, on the pylon, Evan. Yeah, you see on the left-hand side, they look at a clamp at the best tires, about 12 laps or so better than everybody else, pitting out lap 161. Of course, the old tires for Tien. I'm going to give credit to him, Tim Terry, because the 66 car, a lot of the time, somebody stays out old tires. They're the ones wrecking. Uh, not the case. 66 has been nice and clean. Clampett's going to have to make a do uh, a lot with the fresh tires if he wants to be a benefit, but uh, it has kind of been chaos up and throughout the field, and this time by, we're going to go at it. Green flag flies for for Ryan Luza, two laps to go from Richmond, and he blows ahead of a battle for second. Luza was gone and gone early. The battle for position number two seems to be the eight of Michael Conti to the inside, working over Nathan Lyon. They'll run down the back straight away. Yellow flag is out. Not going to make it to the white flag. This race is not official. Caution to flag number 16. And it involved Jimmy Mullis for, I'm sure, what for him feels like the 16th time. And uh, I don't know what happened with Michael Gast on the bottom of the racetrack, but uh, that car just quit turning. And the 46 gets wrecked uh, for another time late in this race. And we're in kind of the situation now where, and I don't blame drivers for racing hard since, well, it is in, of course, a race. But at the same time, you have to think about where you're battling. This is for 25th position, mind you, on the, on the replay. You can see Guest had a decent run coming out into turn one, and Mullis left in space, but Guest just completely blew the bottom of the racetrack trying to make the move. Yeah, just not... Uh, it did not stick at all and, and the caution to flag comes back out and uh, of course a rough go at it. We talked about the 10 to caution to flags that we uh, you know, saw last year, Tim, and, and that this racetrack has a high average but uh, I think what really did us in was kind of that yellow at about 50 to go and Teed makes that strategy call because when you get a late race yellow, you get a bunch of overzealous drivers back in the 20s or so and uh, this is what you get and keep in mind, you know, it's, it's kind of easy and, and short-sighted to say, well, if you're outside of the top 10, quit fighting because there is so much more on the line here than the win that comes with cash every single week as the lucky dog at Eric Smith's going to go around. There's so much more than just trying to be a top eight car to make the playoffs because as I mentioned with Alfala earlier, if you're not familiar with this series, if you do not finish the end of the year top 20 in the points, you are not in this series next year. You're going down to the Pro Series facing 20 of the hot up-and-comers from a road to pro to have to race your way back in here. So it is those mid-20s positions that are especially important. And you still got a lot to fight for. Yes, we still have uh, you know, a few races left in this season. It's early to talk points, but every point does count when we come forward to the end of the season, especially if you're fighting for that top 20 position and to try to lock yourself into this series for next year. Uh, you look at a guy like Malik Ray, who's running right now in position number seven, entered t this evening outside of the top 30 in points. Brian Schoenberg has put his number in the top 20 as well. So there's some uh, drivers that have had some rotten luck this year, Evan, and trying to change it around and trying to change their luck. And we are getting set for our second of three attempts at a green-white checkered finish. I know Ryan Luzer would have really loved it for that last one to count because he was way, way gone. And Nathan Lyon and Michael Conti were busy battling for scraps in second and third. But he'll have to go through the motions again. And once more, he has to get to the white flag for it to be official. If not, we would push it to a third and final attempt. At that point, yellow or checker, it would end the race. So let's see, as it looks like the lights will be going out this time. Yeah, you mentioned it. He's played the restarts very well so far. As long as he gets another good launch, wouldn't be surprised if he goes for another launch to try and get enough separation so no one can try and risk reaching their front bumper towards his back end. He's in he's in the best position out of anyone in this field, I think. He's just got to, it's in his control. It's just a matter of making sure he doesn't make a mistake on the second GWC. 
And let's see, as you see the drivers up on the outside of the racetrack, scrubbing the tires is number two. Gonna be the magic one. Attempt number two at a green white checker to finish in round five of this 2020 EDASCAR Coca Cola iRacing Series from Richmond. Ryan Luza looking for a third win in a row. Green flag flies. Two laps to go. The fight's gonna be behind for second. Keep an eye on Bobby Zelensky. Finds his way into position number four to the inside. Nathan Lyon still hanging on the outside. Side by side for second is Ryan Luza pulls away with this one. Lyon has the advantage on the outside, down into three, and Evan, I think we might get to the white flag. Luza's gonna take it. This race is official. Conti, Lyon still side by side for second. They're gonna battle all throughout the field, but this is allowing Ryan Luza to pull away. He's won the last two. He's gonna go for three in a row in 2020. Ryan Luza, second straight win at Richmond. And what a drive to get through the field tonight. Definitely a well-deserved celebration. Plus 36. Had bad luck in qualifying. Got luck in the strategy game. And in turn, had a quick car once he got up towards the front. What a win for Luza. First time that a driver has won three races in a row in this Coca-Cola iRacing series since 2013. Justin, as you mentioned earlier, and as well, how about Richmond? Nick Ottinger, back-to-back -back in 13 and 14, Humpy in 15 and 16, Alvala 17 and 18, and Ryan Luz has now won the last two here in 2019 and now 2020. He wins round number five of the 2000. 2020 EDASCAR Coca-Cola iRacing Series. What a way to get the job done as he parks it in victory lane tonight. His third win as well is career win number 15. He now holds sole possession of second on the series all-time wins list. As we take a look at our full race results, gets the job done for Williams Esports atop Michael Conti. A good night, Tim Terry, for us at the broadcast booth fantasy wise as all our picks are first and second eighth in line bobby zelensky zach novak great nights for all of those drivers through the top five yarl tian strategy worked somewhat and he gets a p6 with blake reynolds malik ray corny vincent and graham bullen through p10 steve sheehan finishes in position number 11 you look down through logan clampett matt busa nick ottinger ran up front a little bit earlier came home 14th jake nichols and phil diaz the mode motorsports teammates Finish back-to-back. -back. John Gorlinski, Alex McCollum, great qualifying effort. Couldn't turn it into a great finish night. Finishes mid-pack in 18th. Michael Gorilla and Brian Schoenberg. The show finishes 20th. 21st position, Bob Ryan with some bad luck. Dylan Duvall with some bad luck tonight in 22nd. Keegan Leahy had early damage to the front nose. Came home with 23rd. Cattell, 24th. Garrett Lowe, 25th. Keister, 26th. Shearburn, Tires. Bolton and an, a rough one for Ray Alfalo, who showed speed much of the day. And look at the very back page. Still cars on the lead laps all the way through the likes of Davies and, of course, Jimmy Mullis, who we talked a ton about tonight. Ashton Crowder had a good go at it. And down through the cars that finish out of it with Allen, Overland, and Kerwin. Let's talk, though, with our race winner for the virtual Richmond Raceway. And it is for the third time in a row. We queue up the driver of the number 53 machine, Ryan Luza, with a three, Pete Ryan. Congratulations on the win. Uh, 15th of your career. You are now second all time in series history but you did not make this one easy starting from p37 no it wasn't easy at all um i i don't know i can't believe this one um i was going to be happy with the top 20 and just not getting wrecked and we made the right call took two tires early got up to like around 20th and then we had four tires for the really really long run and just was in the right spot in the right time i mean the car was obviously good but without me getting as fortunate as i did getting through lap traffic there's no way i made it up to third and then I don't know what the pit crew did on the stop to go from third to first, but that's what won the race for us. Um, so thanks to my virtual pit crew and everyone at Williams Esports that worked so hard to get this done. 
I mentioned that it was the third in a row for you. First time we've seen somebody in this series win three in a row since 2013. But also Richmond, a track of trends. We've seen now four different drivers, yourself, Ray Alfala, Kenny Humpy, and Nick Ottinger win two races in a row here. Of course, backing up your win from 2019. What is it about Richmond that kind of plays into your wheelhouse? Um, I, I just always love Richmond. It's been my favorite track for his long as i've been on the service um it's reminds me of racing late models you know but like i like i've done in real life um just an amazing track you have to save tires um usually the groove is pretty uh not one not one-sided like we saw tonight but just such a great track you have to roll the bottom and save your tires coming off um just i don't know always a really good track for us so richmond and vegas are probably my two favorite tracks so really 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 happy to keep that trend going um and three in a row as well Vegas will be later on the calendar if you need uh, a race win late in this one. But, Brian, of course, three race wins now in the opening five weeks. Uh, the hottest start out of anybody in 2020. New team, new look for this 2020 campaign. How do you keep this momentum rolling as we head to another one of these kind of elbows up racetracks in Dover for two weeks? Um, I'm, I'm really looking forward to Dover. We were very, very fast at Bristol, faster than we were here at Richmond. Um, and they're pretty similar track wise that's probably the most similar two tracks we can have um so hopefully we carry that bristol speed to dover um but we've just we've put in so much work um we've tested probably 12 or 14 hours in the last 24 getting ready for this race trying to find speed so thanks to everyone at fsr for working hard jared crawford justin bolton cody bias everyone we turned so so many laps and it is really paying off we appreciate the time, Ryan. Congratulations on the race win tonight from Richmond as he gets uh, the fifth race of the season, his third win. Uh, that is a pretty good interval. And Tim, I'll pass things over to you. Michael Conti, who comes home in second. And it's the second top five of the season. Michael, you had to come from about the middle of the field halfway through that race. Talk about keeping your composure and getting back up to the front of the field. Yeah, that was uh, that was probably the craziest uh, Coca-Cola race I've been in uh, since my rookie season. Uh, there was there was just carnage everywhere and mayhem everywhere. People were just going for it every lap. It was super hard to pass. You know, bottom was dominant, so a lot of aggression out there. But we got screwed on that one pit cycle where we stayed out and everybody behind us pitted for tires. So went to the back. We're as low as thirtieth at one point, like you said, and just had to be patient and carve our way through there but uh the number eight wr1 chevrolet was really good team put a good car uh, under me this week uh like ryan said we worked on it a ton to try to find speed and i definitely think we showed it um and that second place is is definitely where that car deserved to finish good race for us overall we start getting down to the heart of the schedule now we go to dover next week second top five how big is this momentum wise heading into the heart of the season yeah, this is definitely the best we've run uh since 2018 we had some Good runs last year on the road courses, but we were never this quick on the ovals. So we did well at Bristol. We did well at Richmond, two different tracks. Dover is a track that I absolutely love. I've won there twice, and I believe the last time we ran there is, is when I won. Um, so, yeah, it's just it's been so frustrating over the last year and a half to constantly come up short. You know, fighting for eighth to twelfth is not what we think we're capable of. Uh, we've won a championship. We've won races. This team, the same people are around me, so we know we're we're capable of it. And um, it's just tough to see, you know, the critique out there about how we're we're never winning or we're not up front or you know whatever. And uh, I'm sick of hearing about it. So it, it's put a little bit of extra um, incentive to run well. Um, we channeled that into our practice this week, and and it definitely paid off. And um, I think we're going to see more of the same at Dover. Definitely looking forward to it. One of the veterans of the series coming home with position number two. Made me look good this evening, Justin. Maybe not as much as you guys did uh, with the top pick. But uh, Michael Conti coming home with a very solid position number two. Can't wait to see what he can do at Dover. I believe you've caught up with our fourth place finisher, Bobby Zielinski. Yes, indeed. Bobby Zielinski came through the field a lot tonight. Uh, Bobby, how would you describe your race? Just like Bristol, we had to come from the back. And uh, I guess I'm the comeback kid this year. I'll take it. We get to keep getting top fives like this. It is disappointing though because we were up front and we had to, you know, we could have stayed up there and had a chance at the win like Luza, but uh, that's life, I guess. And uh, yeah, just got some nose damage uh, early in the run in one of the runs, and I was overheating really bad. I had to clutch the car down halfway down the straightaways to keep it cool, and that was terrible. And we dropped the last. So uh, come back, kids. What, what are we gonna do? You know, we'll we'll keep taking these top fives if we can 
You can come back from last. Okay, that explains why at one point you dropped to, to the top line effect at one point, but got some decent runs tonight. Um, basically, how was it to try and make sure you manage your tires once your car was in good running condition, while also trying to keep pushing forward, while trying to defend at the same time, because it looked like it got pretty crazy at times. I mean, I didn't really tire save because, like, we didn't get really a long enough run, and uh, I was just trying to basically just run as hard as I can to get as many positions back as I could. Uh, we had a, well, I don't remember the lap, but we had a instance where, like, half the field uh, didn't pit, and uh, that was pretty cool. I, I had to come from, like, 31st, but half the field didn't have tires, and I got all the way uh, back up to 17th, and then I got sent for a drift, and then... Uh, yeah, then we, we had a caution. That was nice. And then we just started avoiding wrecks. Luckily, we were on the bottom for most of the time. Like, I was always trying to get myself in the bottom lines, and uh, and it worked out. You know, you, you got to stay in the bottom lines. You got to try to position yourself on restarts so you're restarting in an odd-numbered position, or you're, you're like, in danger of losing five spots every restart. Um, but we just survived, really. We kind of got fortunate with where we were, uh, honestly, but uh, we had a fast car still. And overall tonight, you get some luck. Good run for Bobby Zelensky overall, or good finishing run, I should rather say. Evan, coming away fourth tonight to help his points of position. A big thanks uh, to Ryan, Michael, and then Bobby for chatting with us post-race. Let's take a look now at our Coca-Cola move of the race. And it is going to be the pass for the win from Ryan Luza on board. Chasing down Jarl Tien. Finally got some green flags laps to work with. And you can see on the bumper, sets him up down into turn number one. And I think once Jarl knew that he had the inside positioning, he knew that it was lose a long gone clear by turn two. That is your Coca-Cola move of the race. It puts Ryan Luz in a victory lane, Tim, for the third straight week. Yeah, Ryan Luz is really on a roll, and we'll see if he can continue it when we go to the Dover Speedway here in a couple of weeks' time. But... It's, it's going to be hard to stop Ryan Lewis, but we've seen before where he's kind of struggled late in the season. So can he keep the momentum up? Looking pretty strong now, but what can he do the rest of the way home? Still a long way to go and still a lot of races to run in this E-NASCAR Coca-Cola iRacing Series. But Ryan Lewis has established himself as a driver to beat, especially over these last three races. He had a big bounce back for the likes of Bobby Zelensky, who was able to get a good result out of this, who came into this as your championship points leader. And as we've talked about, the series rolls on to Dover, Delaware. Two weeks' time as we go racing it for the sixth race of this championship. Could lose a go for Ford as the Monster Mile shake things up. Uh, you're not going to want to miss that one um, the next time out. But until then, round number five has fallen into to our rear view mirror. That's it for us from Richmond. On behalf of the entire team at NASCAR at iRacing and for your broadcast team tonight, for myself, Evan Pasoko, for Tim Terry and Justin Prince, as well as a big shout out to the folks behind the scenes. I want to thank you for tuning in and congratulate Ryan Luza. Three in a row. He is dominating so far in 2020. We'll catch you in two Tuesdays time on Tuesday, April the 28th for the virtual Dover International Speedway. That race and every race of the 2020 EDASCAR Coca-Cola iRacing Series going to be found right here on the iRacing Sports Network. Until next time, good night.